preparing to live stream the meeting. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of our uh, the thirteenth um, annual conference <laughs> of uh, Center for Chinese Visual Arts. Okay. Okay, so there is a uh, lag. Um, that's fine. Um, and we we had a very interesting day yesterday. We had uh, uh, three panels uh, yesterday, including um, eight speakers plus one keynote speaker, who is Professor Xiang Biao from University of Oxford. And today we will have another two panels and two slightly larger panel um, and another keynote, um, Dr. Chen Bo from um, City University of Hong Kong, who is now based in uh, Berlin. Um, so I would simply introduce Professor Sorry. David Roberts, who is our first panel chair to chair the first panel of the day. David. Very much, Joshua. Um, good morning, everyone, or in whatever time zone you're in. As Joshua says, my name is David Roberts. I'm Professor of English at Birmingham City University. This morning, uh, we have panel four under the headline, Penning a Pandemic, Lockdown Diaries and Post-Coronial Literature. Um, we have four speakers. We will be taking questions at the end of all of the presentations. If all goes to plan, that will be about 10.20. My job is to make sure that if I can put it in these times, everyone concedes precisely on time. So without further ado, um, I'm going to invite our first speaker, Federico Piccini, uh, to talk to us. Federico is a PhD candidate at Carfoscari University, Venice and Heidelberg University. And his paper is entitled, Yours the Slogans, Yours the Praise, Self Narratives in China During the Epidemic. Over to you, Federico. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen now. And um, okay, I guess you can see it now, right? Okay. So um, I'm just a few words before I start. Um, I'm not exactly a visual arts um, specialist, so I'm really, really grateful for the organizers of this wonderful conference for including me. It's been really, really stimulating to engage. With, with all of you. And, um, and I look forward to today's session, which I'm very, very honored to, to start. Um, so uh, when it comes to narratives or self narratives in China during the epidemic, uh, the first thing we might think of is probably Fang Fang's diary. Uh, Fang Fang is as you probably already know, a very well renowned writer from Wuhan, who uh, was basically caught, um, uh, blocked in the city during the lockdown and started writing a, a, a diary from, from her experience during the lockdown. Um, and this diary has been the object of um, much discussion because of its um, purported social critique and also because of the very swift English translation that appeared soon thereafter. And Fang Fang has been framed some, somewhat as an outsider, uh, um, either as um, a dissident or as a traitor, depending on your point of view. Um, that is of course a very uh, incomplete and one-sided uh, look at her, at her diary because alongside strong, there is, there is some critique there. For example, she has uh, lambasted the Wuhan authorities attempt to gather people to express their gratitude to the government and the party. But on the other hand, uh, she has also been very supportive of nationwide measures, including lockdown, and especially in the first, in the first entries of her diary. Uh, so this is a very one-sided reading of her work. Um, but anyway, um, this, this discourse, this framing of her as, as either uh, alternative or somewhat uh, diametrically opposed to what is perceived as the official narrative uh, around, around the pandemic and, and the prevention um, has 
pretty much seen the re-emergence of an evergreen dichotomy when it comes to when it comes to China, and that is the dichotomy between Guangfang official and Mindian. Uh, Mindian that can be variously translated as something that comes from among the people, or self-funded, or in any way unofficial, non-elite grassroots, which is not exactly uh, oppositional or dissident, but which is often framed as, as such. So uh, coming from outside the system is automatically seen as dissident. Um, Whereas uh, my attempt to read what came out of uh, grassroots narratives during the epidemic in China uh, is framed uh, within this opposition, but I would like to find a way to go beyond it. Um, and for example, I suggest that we may think of official narrative, not versus, but with subjective singularities coming from different walks of life and different contexts and trying to um, frame a dialectic system of, but not limited to, integration, adaptation, negotiation, and also evasion of these voices with the official narrative, or we might, or like we might, as we may call it, the master narrative. A master narrative which has been framed basically along these lines. Uh, China has been in a people's war against, um, led by warriors in white coats through a total mobilization of society against what has been generally framed as a natural calamity or an invisible enemy or even a demon. Um, and that, of course, uh, this, this master narrative, of course, expunges uh, many other ways to see the problem and to analyze the problem. For example, the idea of uh, the natural calamity um, or, of course, expunges the very artificial, absorbs the very artificial global economic system of extraction and trade, which has been behind the spread of the pandemic, while the idea of an invisible enemy um, uh, cancels the very visible bureaucratic negligence and authoritarian abuse that was in place, especially during the first, uh, the first days of January, the first weeks of January. But this is the master narrative. And this master narrative we find in some of the narratives that I'm going to, to present. Um, and the first one I would like to, to introduce is a poem written by Liu, uh, Liu Yishan, uh, who is a member of the Wuhan Writers Association and took part in a project sponsored by the Writers Association together with the Shikan Journal, which is the most important journal when it comes to contemporary poetry in China. The project was called Combat the Epidemic with Poetry and included a very wide range of poems uh, written uh, with, 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 this, with this theme. And this was, uh, actually this project was carried out while Wuhan was still in a lockdown, which gives us, gives us some uh, inspiring suggestions on how um, um, digital means actually uh, helped framing these discourses and making them available while the, the, not only the pandemic, but even the lockdown itself was still, was still in force. Um, so, um, I, I have quoted just a small part of this poem, but I think it's, it's very indicative. Liu Yishan writes, when the black hooded novel coronavirus hits us with a surprise attack, poets, what should we do? What can we do? To white coat warriors fighting night and day in the epicenter, dauntless, braving danger and sacrifice, we offer an ode of profound longing and our heartfelt salute and tribute. What else can we do? All we can do more is wearing masks, drink a lot, wash our hands, stay home, don't go out, we and China are together. So, of course, I should apologize for my sloppy English translation, not, not, no, not, neither English or Chinese or my mother tongue, so it might be it, it probably needs some improvements. But anyway, it gives the idea. It gives the idea of a poem that extremely reflects the master narrative, right? And uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's made up of slogans, uh, warriors in white coats, uh, drink a lot, wash our hands, stay home, don't go out. It might be, uh, these are slogans that we could find on um, posters, um, uh, all around China during, during the epidemic, I mean, also now, but especially during the first phase of the epidemic, and which now are ubiquitous also in Europe, uh, America, and other parts of the world. 
Um, so this is a poem that we might consider extremely official, also for the images it employs. But if we move to another example of, uh, of, this, of poems coming from this project, uh, the, the picture changes a lot. Uh, so um, this is also another very long poem, Wuhan is Silent Tonight by Tian Nan. And I'm also quoting just a small part of it. Silent is Wuhan tonight. Silent the Eastern Lake and the Tanjiang. Silent the Yellow Crane Tower and Funtai. Silent the streets, the trees and the lights. The price of this silence pains me. But if I insisted on asking who made it possible that the virus propagates, will the bats rush forth one after another, descending from dark corners to list our sins to us? All the, all the cures one after another are taking place in silence. And I almost seem to feel the beating heart of this city in Grand Hankou and Old Wuchang in Taijian and, and at Yinlu port, like innumerable hearts beating in unison, mute and powerful. Uh, I, find, I find this poem very compelling and interesting because it also comes from a very official, very Guangfang context. It's part of the project that I introduced before, but it's very, very different from the poem we just, we just, we just saw. Um, so I find it aesthetically very interesting uh, that the, poem, the poet used this operation, this operation of first zooming in and then zooming out of the beating heart of the city. And then he uses, he finds in this silence, in the silence of the lockdown, basically, a space for poetic, poetic contemplation and introspection. Uh, and, that, and that is interesting because um, it's perhaps something you wouldn't expect from a very official project if you think that everything that comes from official projects is just slogans like like the previous poem we saw whereas here um, we still find uh, 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 um, a reasoning which is less bombastic much less absolutist must much less uses much less slogans um, and on the contrary makes full use of uh, of the possibilities that a poetic space might offer again with the silence with this zooming in and zooming out operation, but especially with the silence, which is aesthetically very, very interesting here. Um, if, we move, if we move on and we leave the project for a moment, um, another example, this time very, very different, is from um, another, um, an entirely different context. So uh, this is not, this poem is not part of any uh, officially sponsored projects. But as we know, now in China, uh, China has a, a very burgeoning, very thriving online literature. Um, poets and writers uh, publish their, their writings online. So even if they are outside official channels, they still have a way to make themselves known. Um, and this is one of these, this, and this is the case. This is a case in this direction. So this poem, Please Don't Disturb, was, pub, uh, was written by uh, Long Xiaoling, who was a nurse in one of the makeshift hospitals that were set up in Wuhan to, to uh, deal with the, with the epidemic. Uh, and this also went viral in, in, in a very short span of time. And it's, uh, it's easily understandable why. The reason is easily understandable. Uh, this is also, I'm, I'm also quoting this poem just in part. And she says, please allow me to take off my protective clothes and mask to remove the flesh of my body from its armor. Let me trust my own health. Let me breathe undisturbed. Ah, the slogans are yours. The praise is yours. The propaganda, the modern workers, all yours. I am merely performing my duties, acting on a healer's conscience. Of often there's no choice but to go to battle bare chested. I didn't come to Wuhan to admire the cherry blossoms and I didn't come for the scenery, the reception of flattery, I just want to return home safe when the epidemic ends, even if all that remains are my bones. Um, I would like to especially point out this idea of going to battle bare-chested, because on the one hand, we have the idea of the war, which is pretty much part of the master narrative, of the official narrative. But on the other hand, this, this is precisely a warrior in white coat, right? Because she's a nurse but she wants to go to battle bare-chested. 
And I read this idea of taking off protective clothes, taking off the mask, so taking off the armor, taking off the white coat um, as um, an attempt to get rid of this bombastic and ubiquitous master narrative to let the person em emerge. And in fact, uh, Long Xiaoling wants, just wants to go back home safe. She wants to uh, go back to her family safe after this, this, this nightmare is over. She's not a hero. She doesn't want to be seen as a hero. So in, in some way, she disrupts the narrative of, of, of um, white coat warriors. And that's probably the reason why, although she's not offering any, in a sense, she's not critiquing the master narrative. She's not critiquing the government at all, but this is one of the poems that were censored. Uh, you cannot read it in, in the Chinese internet now. And whereas you can still read Fang Fang, you cannot read Long Xiaoling. And I think this is precisely the reason because she tried to somehow, she was exactly one of the main uh, recipients of the master narrative who tried to evade, and the main protagonist of the master narrative who tried to evade the official narrative. Um, and this is yet one more example of how Guangfang and Min Jian relate to each other. The last example I would like to, uh, to propose um, is, um, this is not poetry, this is a prose by Meng Yu, uh, who's a migrant worker in Beijing and works as a nanny for a family downtown. She's a domestic worker. Um, and she also took part in a writing project, but this is a very, uh, conversely, this is a grassroots writing project um, put up by the Jinjiao Buluo blog which is um, a blog that's um, with a strong attention to write, it's a feminist blog with a strong attention to uh, writings by women and especially by migrants, by women migrant workers. Um, and she wrote this letter to my domestic worker sisters of which I'm quoting just a, just a couple of passages. I won't hide that sometimes I'd even want to shout, I don't fear contagion, but mistreatment by my husband, I'm serious. My family's conservatism suffocates me, and it has been the restrictions forced upon us by this epidemic that have allowed me to see even more clearly the traumas caused to me by my family. I have had enough of this life. And this passage is already very interesting because I find the idea of um, gender structure, gender hierarchy suffocating, just like the virus some, some way takes breath away, very, very compelling. She continues, now, after all these years, we are in our jobs like fish in water. We have got accustomed to the fast rhythms of life in the, metrop in the metropolis. But now we are having a hard time in, going, in readapting to the family life we miss so dearly. And yet the thought of going back to the city has been giving me mixed thoughts. And I have begun to panic that life's so stifling, not to mention the working prospects following the epidemic, probably not so rosy, have made me feel like I had no shelter at all. So thanks to this project, what comes out, what comes to the surface is actually an entirely different discursive frame uh, where the master narrative uh, finds basically no place, finds no room. What we find here is an idea of forced immobility in a material space as well in a social structure, gender especially. Um, it's a social situation that would otherwise uh, remain hidden under the clamor of grand state narratives. Um, and it's also an opportunity to reflect on migrant laborers' agency. So migrant laborers, uh, workers who move from, from, from the countryside to the city for work, who are usually thought to be bent back, nostalgic, wishing to go back, um, Whereas here we find a, a, an entirely different picture and the city uh, in the eyes of this migrant worker comes out not only as a system of unequal access, but also as uh, something offering economic independence. And this blog is very interesting also because uh, alongside this, uh, this, um, um, this example that I'm showing, you have endless other writings by, uh, by, by migrant women uh, and some, sometimes they border 
mutual aid and practical assistance because they're usually uh, there's usually introductions by um, activists of this blog who uh, point at the at uh, uh, for example at job losses by by uh, by these authors. Um, uh, for example, a domestic worker who leaves city and who cannot go back to the city because because of lockdown probably uh, faces the danger of losing her work. I mean, faced the danger the danger of losing her work. So uh, we find um, prefaces by activists of the blog saying, if you're reading this and you enjoy her writing, please also help her find a job. So it's very interesting how narrative and mutual aid and practical assistance, assistance overlap. So to wrap up, um, I'm, I'm, um, I'd like to quote what Ho Weibao wrote in a recent article of his. I don't know if Ho Weibao is here, but um, I found this, uh, this passage very, very interesting for, for the purpose of my presentation. And he says that in a pandemic, literature has an important role to play. It can comfort people's souls, make social critiques and intervene in and even create social realities. It may not be able to change the objective world, but it has the potential to change people's perceptions and experiences of the pandemic. And this is precisely what we have been seeing here, what, what I hope I've been able to show you. Um, so we see that thanks to the, um, to the spread of the internet, but also to other factors, China is indeed a nation of literature, a one war, and I'm using this idea of nation of literature from Heather Inwood's uh, nation concept of nation of poetry of Shu War. Um, and this nation of literature indeed has a lot to offer, as we have seen, a lot of different perceptions on, on, on the pandemic coming either from official context or grassroots context, context, or much more often from an intersection of the two. Um, and we see multiple uses and multifaceted appropriations of, of literature, of writing, of the instrument that we need to tackle on their own terms. So trying to go beyond preset categories, preset dichotomies. And it's because what we find here rarely, only rarely is an either or and much more often, it's a neither nor or both and. So neither nor, neither official nor grassroots per se, but both one and the, and the other. And through this, I think we can try to grasp the richness of the field of cultural production and what it has to offer. If, you, if we only take it on its, own, on its own terms, and if we are willing to include in the field, those who have entered it uninvited but definitely have something to say and to offer. So I hope I've not stepped beyond my time and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Federico. You are, you are bang on. Um, thank you very much for that fascinating paper. Our next speaker is Stephanie Yuen King Chow, who is a visiting research fellow at Brown University. Um, and the topic of her talk is the artist's diary uh, from private diary to collective memory. Stephanie. Yeah, I'm here. Right, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, Everyone's thank you. Great. Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. I'm so honored to be here. And thank you, Professor Zhang Jihong, Professor David Roberts, and also Lorraine. Uh, everyone, I'm Stephanie Chow. And uh, my today, my topic, actually, I just do a slightly change. And I just make the topic from primary diary to social memory to, you can see here, to artists amid the COVID-19 pandemic, three visual diaries related to pharmacy. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, talking about art is more dangerous than talking about politics, you know. For Chinese people, such as me, you know, living in the US, when they make the choice whether to wear a mask or not, it is necessary to take into account not only their physical existence for the sake of pandemic uh, prevention, but also the mental pressure, whether one will be discriminated against if one wears a mask. Although my research focuses on the relationship between the visual diary created by the artist and the collective memory at the beginning of uh, raising, raising such uh, questions, I encountered uh, the contradictory nature of the choice. 
then I, you know, I um, meet some problems that is what, what makes it difficult to wear a mask? What has changed the way we look at people around us? Starting with these questions, the pre presentation hopes to investigate how they survived the epidemic through the case study of three artists. As an artist writing, the writing approach, does it alleviate the pain of pandemic or aggravate the pain of memory? So I say how I get my research started. I got my research started with these three questions you can see below, such as please record your daily life during the COVID-19 outbreak. Do you use works to record your emotions during the epidemic? Do you think it is an emotion or a piece of work? What is the biggest impact of the pandemic on your life? Does long-term isolation make you realize something you didn't realize before, etc.? Yep, and uh, the first interviewee, um, Chinese ink artist Zhang Yanzi from Beijing, who was trapped in New York during, uh, due to the outbreak, is a particularly unique case. Her own ink paintings, you can see here, are closely related to um, traditional Chinese medicine. In her creations, there appeal often Chinese herbal medicines, decoctions, painkillers, all of which are familiar to Chinese people. An earlier work of John's painting was ink painting, Pink Relief Patch, created from 2012 to 2015, as what the picture you can see in the very beginning of my PowerPoint. However, after the rapid outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in New York in March this year, her flight back to Beijing was canceled four times. All air tickets were bought through a lot of effort, but they proved to be not in line with the mainline China's 5-1 policy, so they were eventually invalidated and she had to buy other tickets again and again. Her visa also has also um, expired. Uh, after sending an email to New York consulate, she has not received any response so far. She was in constant anxiety at the beginning of the outbreak. She said, she told me, after the outbreak of the New York pandemic, hospitals were in short, in, short, in short supply of masks and the masks were not available in all New York. I thought maybe that maybe there was a protracted battle. So I bought a sewing machine and I plan to do it myself. From January 23rd to May 4th, I'm, I made a total of 111 masks. At first, Zhang Yanzi as artist made this mask completely for practical purpose, practical use. It took a long time and a lot of work. And it turned out to be that this mask became her work, artwork. I wonder if this mask in her visual diary can be counted as her new pain relief patch. And let's see some mask you can see from the PowerPoint. At the same time, so her, so her work, Mask Diary, she also saw anxiety. Uh, about the identity for Chinese community. She told me, during the pandemic, Chinese in New York are being insulted for wearing masks. To wear a mask or not, uh, not has become a troubling issue among the Chinese American community. Masks have suddenly become a very complex symbol. She responded to this problem by trying not to go out as much as possible. Her sens sensitivity as an artist is like a just double-edged sword, allowing her to perceive through the eyes of surrounding New Yorkers her identity as a Chinese who doesn't speak much English. Uh, as the pandemic spread, it seems that not only the virus is going, but also the distance between people around and yourself. In answering several of my seven questions, she talked about her real feelings. She said, there is no doubt that the pandemic has changed our way of life and also put some original hidden social problems into the spotlight. For me, when I wear huge black mask and the sunglasses, when I go out to the supermarket, masks are no longer being used to prevent the virus. The safety I need is not only a physical level, but also on the mental and, and the identification level. I mean, you can see from this work. When I, you know, when I started to do this research myself, actually, I was, you know, self-quarantined in Providence, Rhode Island, the U.S. It was quite a hard time. The town was being totally locked down, and Yanzi 
and the artist, also one of my friends whom I talked frequently. And you can see she recorded our talks um, in the Mask Diary. And her feelings towards the movie, I recommend that you can see Chu Xue Zhe, Zhou Wan Jing Tui Chu Xue Zhe, Stephanie recommend the beginner, the, the film. Uh, and uh, also you can see from this picture, this work, uh, the background of her Mask Diary, you can figure out easily, is the Statue of Liberty. And the next, people who exist in the flesh are becoming viruses in the eyes of others. The, resist, uh, the existence of individual as a human has the same duality as the pharmacy pointed out by, by Yak the Reader in Plato's pharmacy, or the pharmacia the Platon. Uh, both are poison and as an uh, antidote. The ancient Greek word for pharmacy in the Reader's Plato's pharmacy is a pharmacon which also comes from uh, Socrates in the Phrygias. The reader's discussion of Plato's pharmacy here is an interpretation, actually it's an interpretation of a Socrates discussion of writing in the second half of Plato's Phrygias. In his view, um, Socrates distingu distinguished good writing from bad writing. The reader then associate it with the uh, spring demon pharmacia which was analyzed in the beginning of the dialogue in Phaedrus. Uh, the reader reconstructed uh, Plato's pharmacy with great interest, not only to review how Socrates belittled writing, but to connect together several words related to pharmacy, as well as to connect statements and events that are related to pharmacy together. In the reader's perspective, Socrates' wording contains um, contains an um, attitude that is constant with his view of drug, drugs. Uh, words are also kind of drug, uh, a kind of pharmacy, which can cure all poison. He himself, however, was poisoned to death because of his speech. And the reason for his death was in turn because his speech poisoned young people. You know, how ridiculous it is. But here is the complex entanglement of pharmacy, words, uh, speech, thoughts, and even logos. And actually, in the history of modern Chinese literature, uh, Lu Xun also believes that the literature is the diagnosis of social chronic disease. In his novel, Medicine, the writer with a medical background puts an awakening medicine, medicine for numbness of human nature. The blood of a revolutionary cannot cure Hua Xiaoxuan's disease. The, uses of, the usage of human blood as a medicine was originally a form of traditional Chinese medicine, but it cannot really reconcile and heal the disease of Chinese people who are then suffering in pre-modern China. Blood steamed bread is naturally expected to be a good medicine for Hua Xiaoxuan's family. However, the so-called good medicine in reality becomes a poison to him and eventually quickened his demise. So what I want to say here, emphasize here, is the word writing here should not be limited to literature, but also should you know, be used to let us to explain and think about what the artists have been through during the pandemic. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, artists started a unique personal writing from their perspectives. This is dualistic writing whose main idea is closely related to, to the medical nature of art. Let's go back to Zhang Yan's a little bit. She launched the Mutant the Email Problem Project on September 29th this year. You can see from the background, right? And on, you know, um, she interviewed many artists who were stranded overseas due to the pandemic on the pl art, uh, online platform from CAFA, Central Cad Academy of Fine Arts Art Information Network, among which 16 artists, including Zhang Yanzi herself and Liu Xiaodong, um, et cetera. This project is a similar to a relay interviewing two artists at one time and publishing their works during the pandemic. And then we just go smoothly to Liu Xiaodong. Liu Xiaodong, a Chinese artist living in Beijing, flew from Beijing to Eagle Pass, Texas, US on January 28th. Uh, he told me he did not expect that a month later, the outbreak in China and the subsequent outbreak in New York was just like a double blow because of which all airplanes were suspended and he cannot go anywhere. After being stranded for three months, she, uh, he reviewed the identity anxiety he had experienced as a Beijing or in New York. 
in the exhibition document during pandemic prepared for Listen Gallery on April 6, uh, April 6 this year. He said that he said Beijingers were like rats crossing the streets, even in the suburbs of the city banners saying, Beijingers are not allowed to enter. We're hanging at the tram entrance of village. You can only imagine how Beijingers were received elsewhere. Um, Wuhan people today are just like Beijing, Beijingers 70 years ago. Of course, he told about SARS, you know. And actually you can think New Yorkers in US are just like Wuhan people in China, right? And he continued, foreign countries do not hunt such banners, but in the depths of their heart, people probably feel the same. And in this brief diary, Liu Xiaodong immediately treats his all setter situation in New York to slogan, Beijing people are forbidden to enter. The Beijing people who were ostracized by surrounding areas in these days are now the Chinese who are questioned by New Yorkers, right? But the real question should be, who are the Beijing people? Are we all the unwelcome Beijing people? Liu's painting, especially the watercolor painting depicting the scenery of New York City during the pandemic has its own function as pharmacy. It is a witness of the pandemic, a representation, but also a kind of handwriting. And you can see some several works here. And um, you know, after the BLM campaign, Liu called it, not only is the pandemic not fading, but the chaos happened again. And airlines are out of service, forcing me to witness the history. It seems that the Liu's artistic writing of history, is, uh, sorry, artistic writing of history is toxic in itself. At the same time, Liu Xiaodong had to paint again. Uh, she said he could only finish a very small painting in one day. From March to April, he painted such small watercolors. The scope of the painting is the maximum living radius he can reach, such as Chelsea in the north, Soho in the south, and Hudson River in the west. If you compare Zhang Yanzi's works with Liu Xiaodong's, um, although their paintings methods are different, they have selected the material that they can easily obtain and, and in a self-quarantine during the pandemic, such as ink and watercolor, and the, the self-made mask and the watercolor books. What they paint was exactly where they could see all the limitations of life during the pandemic. And the last, we're gonna see the, another example that is the Chinese artist Zhang Xiaogang who spent all his time in Beijing during the pandemic. Interesting enough, uh, if we look back to the history in 2003, just you see from the PowerPoint, the right part. Uh, in 2003, on the eve of Zhang Xiaogang's solo exhibition, Anisia and Memory at Galhui Du Fonds, SARS broke out in China. He wrote a letter to the French gallerist, the Katarina of Galhui Du Fonds, on May the 16th. In an interview with the artist Zhang Xiaogang recently in his studio, uh, I recall this passage, the letter he wrote to the gallerist. Um, written by the artist himself. The artist who has always been known for dealing with the theme of memory also tell me, admit that the COVID-19 pandemic is very different from SARS, which has a huge impact on Chinese people. He said, this time all political violence and power are projected onto this and it's very sensitive. Any change will cause a chain reaction. All this happened in the first two months later Wuhan was in lockdown. The word lockdown was not used in the past, but this time it has become a very popular phrase. The city, the village, and the, even the community are one by one locked down. And finally, people fell into all kinds of credit crisis. The, my deep personal experience, Zhang Xiangang said, my deep uh, personal experience is that the most evil and the darkest aspect of human nature is exposed whatever in the subconscious was exposed. Why did I paint this picture where a monster is next to a mirror? Because I realized that the two faces of human are fully displaced this time. You can see the new painting here. Um, he shows a man, it shows a man looking in the mirror after a bath and seeing a devil with blue faces and ears just like horns. Um, like the, 
just like the previous Zhang Xiaogang's work, it is still a poetry, and uh, there are still many scarred objects related to memory. However, since the Anidia and the memory uh, series that began in 1997, he feels the dual characteristic of the, of the pandemic at the metaphorical level. He thinks that this is indeed very similar to what the reader said when he was, when he was tr trying to interpret Plato by dual pharmacy. The person who saw his true self in the mirror was not frightened, but stared at himself quietly. He thinks that the painting as an artist's way of writing has been given due significance in the process of writing. There are two sides of the same thing. It's only in the process of healing and taking drugs you find the meaning. And, as, and uh, he also said, artist and adventure, which, uh, which means that there is not always an answer if you know everything, you are not doing art. Art is, is not pursuit of truth, but a process. And also this one, you can see how he painted his self-portrait with his dog, Ken, right, during the pandemic. Let's come to the conclusion, right? When an international pandemic occurs, all countries are shirking responsibility. Few countries are willing to take the responsibility you know because they are afraid of to because they are afraid of to claim the origin of the plug even if we know where the pandemic first broke out all these matters made remembering what we experienced much more difficult in this simple case study based research we see how these three three chinese artists try to respond to both reality and their memory however at this moment Zhang Yanzi is still trapped in new york Liu Xiaodong and his wife Yu Hong have returned to, returned to China safely, but their daughter is still in the US. Zhang Xiaogang has been living in Beijing during the pandemic, canceling all overseas trips, and the original planned solo exhibition in Hong Kong has been postponed. Instead of slowing down the pace of the world and uh, stranding all major and minor events, the pandemic has suspended the memory subject and the media sub subject. Uh, we like us, we can't think about the pandemic only from the perspective of the country and nation, because the epidemic has aroused extreme nationalist sentiment. But we also can't stop the pandemic only from the perspective of healing pain, because history has become a highly complex and it seems to be smoothing out what it is exactly ex experiencing through the resistance. In other words, anemia and the memory they just happen simultaneously, just as the reader observed in the analysis of Plato's pharmacy. They construct and deconstruct each time, all the time. Um, artists sensitively point out how they work hard to survive between this reality and the memory. Zhang, Xiao, uh, Zhang Yanzi called it pain relief, Liu Xiaodong called it inspiration, and Zhang Xiaogang called it struggle. That is my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed, Stephanie. Right. Um, our next, mm. our next speaker is UC Liu from the Beijing Inside Out Art Museum, currently a PhD candidate at Bryn Mawr University in the States. Uh, do Should we have... I... Hello? We do have you, sir. I'm just asking... Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello, UC. How are you? Hello. Good. How are you? Very good. Are you all set? Yes. Oh, by the way, I'm still a, I'm not a PhD candidate yet. Ah, <laughs> I just want to okay. clarify that. <laughs> In intended. Um, All right. Thank you. Ap yeah. Apologies um, for the misinformation. All right. No, no, um, that's the, fine. Thank you. The, the floor is yours, you see. Thank you. Um, okay, let me see. Can you see the screen? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, Okay, um, thank you um, for accepting me to this conference and um, I'm very glad to share and gave this presentation and thank you, David, and thank you, Joshua, and shout out to Lauren for everything. So my presentation today is titled uh, Chinese COVID-19 Romance on Societal Symptoms and of the Coronavirus and the Eternal Corona Future. We are in a Corona relationship and we cannot break up with it. 
the relationship will continue permeating and constituting the post-pandemic world. What does it mean and how does it feel to live life in this unfair relationship? And where is this affair heading to? Especially in mainland China, we have perhaps already entered the post-pandemic future. In this presentation, I propose a corona relationship constituted by societal symptoms. I interweave critical discussion pertaining to political agenda and social control with the experiential show, that is, excerpts of my poetic diary, 14-day romance with quarantine, written during my compulsory stay at a Beijing hotel room in March this year. The diary can be read on the triple and percent platform operated by the New Center for Research and Practice. Day one, breathing in this mask makes me sleepy. My skin itches under the rubber gloves. The bus has been driving for three hours in my district, dropping all 10 passengers at their designated quarantine locations. I am the last and I lost count of how many times the bus stopped. I am finally here. I walk out of the bus and take out my luggage. A fully covered medical staff comes, spray the disinfectant all over my body. The invisible uh, microscopic uh, virus. You said, sorry, and um, we can't see your presentation. Oh. It's just a black screen. I didn't know if that was deliberate. No, no, oh. There Can we go, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, oh, okay, <clears throat> I'll just do it. So earlier it was this picture. <laughs> Okay. Um, so ha um, happy to take it from where you left off. You see. Okay. So the invisible microscopic virus has shaken the world, throwing a stone to the glass house of globalization, which is likewise invisible, but has thoroughly permeated our lives. As Ye Kui has reflected in April, the geopolitical borders that was blurred by global capitalism, trade and cultural exchange are now restored. Borders are closed and rebuilt, evidently in the total lockdown of Wuhan in January, in the all cap tweet by US President Trump yelling, this is why we need borders in March. And in a hopeless conundrum where international students and scholars felt trapped abroad and at the same time rejected by their homeland when flights are limited and, unafford and unaffordable after the suspension of flights between the world and China. As well as in a two meter distance from my quarantine bed to the door, which I am not allowed to go beyond. My quarantine room is the space designated for me and my only place. I was lucky to return home from Philadelphia in March to China with a normal price ticket flight, flight ticket and so fortunate to not get infected. Not so lucky that I returned the day after the policy changed and I was put into compulsory quarantine in a hotel room with such minimal furnishings. They fed me so well that I gained some weight. I was in love with the smell of the disinfectant. I wrote this diary to keep me sane and not too bored. I wrote it in English because I want to share with my Western friends and colleagues and gave some discomfort and comfort to them at both time. I am glad I could be quarantined and allowed to wear masks in March and not worried I'd be seen as yellow pearl and stabbed in the Philadelphia subway station. The smell of sodium hypochlorite is like a perfume. We call it 84 disinfectant here. Feel safe, alive, with a desire I cannot name. Just like a drug, I take a deep breath to bring the air inside me, aphrodisiac of the latest trend. I drag my luggage into the hotel room but my odyssey is over. I am back home. Having tested negative for coronavirus does not mean one is COVID free. In the following, I expand the definition of getting the virus beyond its medical realm to the personal, the empirical and the, so and the social by which a corona relationship is fostered and we are all trapped in. As the virus is laden with geopolitical implications, everyone has become doctors and police. Omnipresent monitors of a certain kind. In clinical practice, symptoms and signs are the pair of subjective and objective evidence of the disease, and diagnosis is the major process of a doctor's visit, consisting of identification and discernment based on the symptoms and signs seen in the patient. Symptoms and diagnosis, two important terms in treating a disease, can find their roots in ancient Greek, namely the legendary father of Western medicine, Hippocrates, 
who has increasingly appeared on the internet in the midst of a global health crisis. There was never one Hippocrates in ancient Greece, however. In effect, the authorship of the Hippocratic Corpus is questionable, and it has been generally agreed by classicists that the corpus is actually an assemblage of texts written by multiple authors. Unlike today's diagnosis, which aims to identify the cause and provide effective treatment, the Hippocratic method intends to record all the symptoms and signs so that prognosis could be carried out ahead. My daydream is interrupted. A notification on my cell phone beeps. I forget to report my body temperature at 3 p.m. My armpit is demanding attention. In March, the government confirmed the efficacy of Chinese herbal medicine, introducing the three medicines and three prescriptions, uh, San Yao San Fang, as a successful antivirus weapons. Last fall, Chinese traditional medicine was vociferously promoted by the current leadership emphasizing that it embodies and epitomizes, epitomizes the cultural and technological accomplishments inherited from the ancient time, unique to China, making the Chinese dream come true. For many Chinese abroad, including me, along with the emergency, Balangan joins the daily ritual drinking as a preventative dose. On the one hand, such rhetoric as accentuates the contrast between the East and West or the Chinese and the others, transforming medicine to an aspiration that nourishes national, nationalistic values. On the other hand, through traditional medicine, the current leadership has successfully made the antivirus battle a patriotic affair. On May 24th this year, in the fifth session of the 13th National People's Congress, Congress. Chairman Xi told the representative group of Hubei province about the national relaunch and promotion of the patriotic health campaign, a movement started in the 1950s during the Great Leap Forward. By doing so, I contend, each individual is given the responsibility and rights to obey, follow, and mutually supervise the strict aggressive coronavirus measurements, both on themselves and the others. Thinking Western medical terms and the promotion of Chinese traditional medicine, what I want to emphasize is their shared unspoken proposition. By proposition, I mean that whether the ancient were the clinical were the herbal, there is an implicit interest in prognosis. Put differently, the ability to recognize and identify the potential virus carrier and prevent future expansion. Everyone becomes potential carrier and there's an increasing obsession to identify them as early as possible. What, what has been endorsed in this preventative method, what has been endorsed is the preventative method outside the clinic, which could be carried out by the level of individual and the community. Every time when one present presents their health QR code in green, when supermarkets points the thermometer to its customer's head, when one finds themselves seized in horror to see someone maskless nearby, such lived experience makes up a corona relationship. COVID has evolved to a social phenomenon and every evidence of it can be considered as a symptom. As our body temperature fluctuates, as our throats itches and wants to cough, as we continue living life in this normalized norm abnormality, we're all sick and infected. Simultaneously, diagnosis has long left the clinic room in the hospital, it roams in the public spaces and enters our homes. Decisions and treatment can be made when symptoms are identified and judged. The ultimate goal of treatment is to restore the perfect harmony between the individual, social, and the environmental. And just like doctors today swear on the Hippocratic Oath, symbolically, I was instructed to sign the paper to declare my responsibility at the beginning of my compulsory 14-day quarantine, agreeing to sanitize the space, monitor myself, report my data, love the country, and comply. They cut off the light in the bathroom. The switch shares the same circuit with the central ventilator. My potential viral air won't bother others. Other potential viral, viral air won't annoy me. Another pivotal component, I believe, in a corona relationship is information and truth, which still remain enigmatic to me. When people are reduced to their home space, yet distant from the outside world, 
They acquire understandings of the pandemic chiefly through the virtual world. Everyone maneuvers through authoritative reports and informal posts and stories, all under the backdrop of state censorship. There exists extensive discussion over the ways people have tried to capture and share the stories of the whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliang on the social media platform this spring, so I shall not repeat. In the ever evolving situation, individuals must harvest their own assemblage of truth in understanding the world around the virus, their own preventative practice and even cures. Again, in this process, everyone has taken up the role of doctors, making their own identification, judgment and diagnosis. We all join the collective authorship of the Corona Corpus. Again, this backdrop, the patriotic toned antivirus campaign is at its best work. What enters, our, our, what enters the assemblage is also the 404 science and page could not be accessed with an exclamation mark. Declaring a triumph of social borders and forever returning us to the Plato's cave. Moving on, elements from my own quarantine um, diary, such as sanitizers, thermometers, and teacups have become alternative wounding systems and devices both in informing myself of the pandemic and, in, and in propagating a corona future. Through their material, visual effect, and behavior quality, these items makes up the after effects. Oh. They gave me a bottle of 84 disinfectant. I wiped all the surfaces and sprayed the bathroom. This new perfume infuses my room. I take a deep inhale one after another. Then my period came. The medical staff are spraying the 84 disinfectant again in the hallway. I think of the swimming pool. My body is flowing and penetrated by the 84 air. What day is today? I am hungry and the breakfast arrives. The plastic bag that holds the food still drips with 84 disinfectant spray. I inhale as, an, as I unwrap, insatiably delicious. The breakfast arrived every morning by the hotel room door, dripping with 84 disinfectant and the smell of it continues to pervade everyone's life in China. It has transcended beyond a mere disinfectant. Its smell, visual logo, the plastic bottle, and each spray's ephemeral presence have become notions of health, demarcating a safe space and invoking a hopeful future to come. Twice a day during my quarantine, as directed by the guideline which I signed the first day, I put the cold thermometer under my, under my armpit and then sent the number on WeChat to the hotel receptionist who is hired by the government now to oversee us. Thermometers have become the second most popular thing after face mask. Every doorway of the shopping mall, every entrance of the exhibition during Beijing Gallery Weekend in June, and before each subway entrance is stationed with staff holding thermometers. It does not matter what level of risk the city is at, or if there has been no new positive case for a while, where the thermometer is simply broken. What is important is that this little device or the people with it can decide our entrance. They control our movements. What is also important is that we find ourselves no longer frown when we become naked with our temperature displayed on big screens. We ourselves are in fact normalizing this abnormality. Every office and every household now has a thermometer. Like the sound of coughing, when the temperature goes beyond 37.3, the atmosphere will immediately become tensed up and we find ourselves quietly being socially diagnosed by people around. They gave me two dozen henners, an extra towel, which I have no place to hang, a pair of Mickey Mouse slippers, which I love and wear every day, a bright lamp for bathroom where there's no outlet, so much disinfectant gel and wipes. There are three things I cannot take away, the thermometer, the giant bottle of 84 disinfectant and two white cups whose body curvature is smooth and streamlined, topped with a lid out of style. The style, this type of cup is called the Victory Cup. It was designed for Mao in, 1948, in 1958 for the party's official. 
but Danny got popularized, appeared in all governmental and diplomatic meetings, and then in offices, hotel rooms, and in everyone's home. My grandparents had a pair. The bottle and the smell of the 84 disinfectant, the way we have to stop and get our temperature tested, sanitizers and thermometers become devices in this multisensorial fluid assemblage of corona relationship. Public health guidelines and measurements are paving a path for corona future. On a more personal level, when I see the victory cup, which I used during my quarantine, my only cups, appear on the state broadcaster every night at 7 p.m., my memory of the quarantine is activated. Even the concept of the hotel has evolved into a mnemonic device forbidding me from forgetting and recovery. Memory here thus is retrieved, survives, and carried over for the future. International discourse such as we are not going back to normal and endless speculations of a post-pandemic world have flooded long since the pandemic outbreak. The world has changed indeed. Symptoms are no longer limited to the clinical realm. Diagnose, diagnosis or prognosis of the disease has become a social responsibility and, and everyone is authoring the corona corpus. Through Chinese patriotic health movements, as well as the elements which I have taken from my own quarantine diary, such as sanitizers and thermometers, I exemplified subtle ways of how this unprecedented, unprecedented event reverberates the new normality and penetrates our daily life. The romance has just started. Welcome to an eternal corona future. I can start packing now. Once I came out of the quarantine labeled plastic curtain, I can never go back. So I make sure I don't leave things behind. I come out and I go to the reception table, pay the quarantine hotel fee and get my certification. The certificate will allow me to enter my community neighborhood. The hotel staff is kind and helps me carry my luggage to mom's car downstairs. My romance ends. Oh fuck, I left a box of mandarins I treasured in the room by the windows. Enjoy the sweet, juicy citrus, baby. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that fascinating presentation. Um, sorry we had a little glitch at the outset, but thank you so much. I'm now delighted to introduce Professor Claire Chambers. Um, professor Chambers is a professor of global literature at York University. And the title of her paper is COVID's Metamorphoses and Post-Coronial Fiction. Uh, Claire, are you there with us? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Hello. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Great. Thank you. So um, my title has changed a little bit um, because I want to talk probably about peri-coronial literature. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, so I think realistically I've got a lot to get through and what I'm talking about is probably around the virus. A lot of these things prefigure and predict um, in quite prescient ways, but are not necessarily what I'm calling post-coronial. Although in the conclusion, if I have time, I'll talk about a few texts that have been published subsequent to our current um, pandemic. So, um, this is the structure around which I'm going to talk. Um, I should say a big thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, so I will talk a bit personally as well, because it's been so interesting to hear other people's experiences. So I'm starting with a bit of a diary myself. And then I'll talk quite generally about what I'm calling peri-coronial, eustopian um, fiction, um, mostly focusing on Pakistan, which is my area my main area of research. Then I'll look at um, Chinese dystopias with reference to Moyan and Marjian and conclude um, with, as I say, what's going on right now. Mm. So when the coronavirus pandemic really took hold and went global, I was blindsided. One of the novels I turned to at this time was Mohsin Hamid's 2007 novel, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, in which the protagonist, Changez, declares, and here's the quote, I had previously derived comfort from my firm's exhortations to focus intensely on work, 
But now I saw that in this constant striving to realize a future, no th thought was given to the critical personal and political issues that affect one's emotional present. In other words, my blinders were coming off and I was dazzled and rendered immobile by the sudden broadening arc of my arc of vision. So I think that quote resonates really well with how I feel about the pandemic and the fast moving emotional present in general and my loved one's health in particular. I usually throw myself into my research, teaching and editorial work but in the first three months with my son ill with suspected coronavirus, um, he quickly got better. And amid fears for my frail mother-in-law, plus for a friend who was bereaved, um, not through COVID, but she wasn't able to see the deceased for, uh, only for a very short time. I suffered a series of personal and professional crises that left me overwhelmed by the situation's enormity. Indeed, I was unable for some time to do any reading or writing. And I know that I wasn't alone in experiencing writer's block at the beginning of this lockdown. I actually benefited from an illuminating and curiously uplifting article published in early April by Aisha S. Ahmed, an academic who is no stranger to danger and who puts the current health crisis in the context of other emergencies. Ahmed wrote in a way that helped my paralysis no longer to worry me. The legacy of this pandemic will live with us for years, perhaps decades to come. It will change the way we move, build, learn and connect. There is simply no way that our lives will resume as if this had never happened. And so, while it may feel good in the moment, it is foolish to dive into a frenzy of activity or obsess about your scholarly pro productivity right now. That is denial and delusion. Your first few days and weeks in a crisis are when I would focus on food, family, friends, and maybe fitness. Her recommendation that you should focus all your attention in the early phase of any crisis in looking after your mental health and securing your physical, your family and your home is sound advice. It's nothing to feel guilty about if it's impossible to concentrate on reading, writing, and other creative or intellectual tasks at this time. This play took most people by surprise, as Mohsen Hamid said, dazzling and rendering us immobile. To be sure, sober warnings came from China and other countries in East Asia. However, as Ipek Demir shows, these harbingers were underestimated by a complacent and ethnocentric West, whose hubris was fueled by what she calls epidemiological neoliberalism. The current dystopian situation feels like Kali Yuga, um, the Hindu idea of the last phase before the end of the world, or at least the beginning of the world end. You have to remind yourself that this is real and no fever dream. Things should slowly return to some semblance of normality, especially given the news about a possible vaccine today. But to adapt the title of Sabine Javeri's story and that of its parent anthology, edited by Pakistan, um, Pakistani critic Maniza Shamsi, um, it collected together post 9-11 Pakistani women's writing. There is no doubting that the world has changed. Covid's metamorphoses are entrenching inequalities in ways that will be difficult to reverse. Far from being a leveller, the crisis is widening already vast social chasms. Take the gender pay gap, the pandemic is likely to set female academics back by decades and calcify gender inequalities in higher education because of the emotional labour and caring burdens women tend to shoulder. The virus itself and consequent lockdowns lay bare the fault lines of social injustice that structure our world. Writing The Guardian in April, Stefan Collini shone a spotlight on universities' ruthless and pervasive use of insecure contracts. Holders of these contracts are mostly women, who are cheaper and more expendable than their male colleagues. Colleeny calls this group the academic precariat. Amid the scramble to move undergraduate teaching online, the struggle for a just dispensation for this precariat has been undermined now more than ever before. As student numbers fall, zero hour contract holders are forced to do even more work for less or, or lost their jobs altogether. The Twitter account, at Ask Deans, which satirises HE middle and upper management, 
grimly summarised this situation in the directive. I know you are on a nine month contract, but we still need online only, in-person only and hybrid course syllabi for your new course by June the 1st. Put differently, universities are cynically using this crisis to streamline the already austerity pummeled higher education sector and to make swinging ex expenditure cuts. In Precarious Life, The Powers of Mourning and Violence, 2004, Judith Butler gives readers a detailed understanding of precariat um, and, the, and precarity. Precarity is commonly and rightly associated with social class, being widely interpreted as vulnerability, another word of which Butler is fond. She characterised precarity and, in, and planned vulnerability um, as being embodied, alluding to the precarity of bodies our rupturable skin and easily failing organs in ways that find new echoes in the time of coronavirus. She further emphasizes that human sociability connects us to other bodies within relational networks. Demonstrating the interdependence of all humans and the fallacy of individualism, Butler writes, you make me and your loss undoes me. It is not as if an I exists independently over here and sim then simply loses a you over there, especially if the attachment to you is part of what composes who I am. Who am I without you? She shows that we experience mourning and grief in the face of the loss of that other to whom we love and without whom we do not exist in the same way. The term precariat is popular in academia, especially for discussing the planned vulnerability of those whom Amitabha Kumar, writing about the US context in World Bank literature, calls adjunct faculty. These are the early career lecturers highlighted by Colini, who work from contract to contract with no sick pay, holiday wage or future assurance. But this concept of precarity might also be extended to encompass our present corona crisis, given the British government's identification of extremely vulnerable people for shielding as well as the unprecedented threat the virus poses to existing and future jobs or careers. Anyone experiencing severe anxieties around sudden unemployment or potential homelessness might be seen as part of the academic precariat. It is impor also important to note that when the virus strikes, it is people from impoverished and minoritized areas the world over who are dying at higher rates than those, those able to shelter at home in more privileged places. In Britain, um, black, Asian and um, minority ethnic people are dying at exponentially higher rates due to a complex nexus of poverty, social class, lack of access to healthcare and their occupation, among other factors. As the head of Bradford's QED Foundation, Muhammad Ali puts it, they said that COVID-19 does not discriminate. That was clearly not true, end quote. The pandemic made plain the unequal access to resources various groups and individuals have. In Singapore, which was initially held up as a great COVID success story for its contact tracing and virus containment, it emerged that those who were dying were overwhelmingly minorities. The so-called success relied on ignoring the country's 300,000 migrant labourers who lived at amongst quasi-segregated crowded conditions in foreign worker dormitories. And there was quite a big resurgence of the virus because this precariat was never looked after, with many of the new cases coming from the vulnerable group. And something similar was happening with migrant workers from South Asia in the oil-rich states of the Arabian Gulf. The virus exposes and magnifies the usually ignored fact that the elite benefit from structured, structural inequalities on which their countries rest. At an excellent online conference on our post-coronavirus future, organised by Om Prakash Devedi at Aura University in India, the novelist and politician Shashi Tehrore gave one of the keynote addresses in this Indian conference, alongside Anki Mukherjee, Pavan Malreddy and other luminaries. Presenting the example of India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Tarot observed that in countries where strong men are in office, these populists have used the virus to shore up further power. The human consequence is increased fear of the other, whereby there is a marked and widespread hostil hostility to entire communities. And we've been hearing about the Western um, prejudice towards 
mask wearing um, East Asian appearance, people with East Asian appearance in the West. Um, this has also been going on in India. Terror rightly poured opprobrium on the toxic hatred many right wing Hindus there have also been shown towards Muslims. An ill-advised meeting held by the proselytizing Tablighi Jamaat movement in March was used as a stick with which to beat Muslims for spreading illness. However, the governmental BJP also held a big gathering around the same time, so this is very much selective outrage. Indian politics is severely infected by religious hatred. Communal tension has been escalating in areas where most people never imagined this would happen. One friend in India said, even if the country manages to escape the worst excesses of COVID-19, the country is now doomed to live with this virus of communal hatred. Moving next to the realm of peri-coronial fiction. On March the 10th, Kamala Shamsi, the Pakistani novelist, started the hashtag, hashtag COVID-19 reading list, where people shared reading plans for any lockdown or quarantine situation. Should it surprise us or come as no surprise that many of the titles recommended belong to the genre of dystopian fiction? For me too, dystopian writing was both a tonic and almost a guide when it comes to understanding the current coronial destruction to lives and livelihoods and imagining our post-coronial future. In a collection of essays, In Other Worlds, Science Fiction and the Human Imagination, Margaret Atwood coined the portmanteau term Ustopia. This brings together the utopia and dystopia categories because she argues that like yin and yang, one contains the germ of the other. Atwood doesn't unpack that pronoun us in his Ustopia. However, that collective pronoun of society, its breakdown and an ineffable relationality between humans is a focal point for many non-Western Ustopian writers. The notion of Ubuntu, meaning a person is a person through other people, emanates from Southern Africa but has Pan-African resonance. Similarly, in Islam, a hadith makes it clear that the Muslim community is interconnected like a person's body. Quote, if the head aches, the whole body aches. As this emphasis on pain makes clear, how interconnected we are is double-edged, especially at a time of crisis like this one. Pericolonial Ustopian authors expand the notion of togetherness beyond the confines of one continent or religious group. They examine the corporeal closeness of all human beings and the consequent need for social justice on a global scale. Just to take two Pakistani examples, in Mohsen Hamid's Exit West, we find scenes that appear to have nothing to do with the main narrative arc. There is a sudden shift to a different location and new characters before a jump cut back to the main plot. St such snapshots evoke a planetary snarl up of lies and in a mostly bleak novel, foster an alloyed optimism about interactions between white, brown and black people in future landscape. Hamid also gives us the following quote. It might seem odd that in cities teetering at the edge of the abyss, young people still go to class, but that is the way of things with cities as with life. For one moment, we are pottering about our errands as usual and the next we are dying and our eternally impending ending does not put a stop to our transient beginnings and middles until the instant when it does. I think this sentence is a brilliant reminder of the strange reality and triviality to these surreal and historic times we've been living through. In her stellar new monograph, Contemporary Women's Post-Apocalyptic Fiction, Susan Watkins singles out Bina Shah's Before She Sleeps as an important post-colonial dystopian novel. Watkins summarizes the text thus, quote, set in a repressive Southwestern Asian city, a nuclear war has caused a genetic mutation that causes a deadly type of cervical cancer to kill millions of women, end quote. The mutation Shah envisages has selectively killed off most women. But what we've seen with the coronavirus is that it isn't discriminatory. It hurts everybody, including Britain's Prime Minister, Health Secretary and Chief Medical Officer, and America's President, First Lady, and two senators. Though as we've seen, the economic um, and you know, 
the, there are huge inequalities, but but at the point of contact, and, and obviously um, most people don't have access to this wonderful treatment that these people have, but uh, the virus itself does not discriminate. The pandemic does showcase social inequalities in that rich people can pay for private testing and get better care. They may also cocoon themselves in comfortable safe houses without worrying about domestic violence, looming unemployment or being unhoused. The poor have no such luxury to main maintain a social distance. The cliff edge road ahead is bumpy and our view of it fogged. Yet these peri-coronial utopian writers provide some relief with the crystalline clarity of their roadmap. Moving now to Chinese dystopias. Published in 2009, Mo Yan's Frog is a dystopian novel blended with folktale and magical realism, which scrutinizes the China of the 1960s to the 21st century. Mo Yan is particularly interested in the one child policy of 1980 onwards, which fi finally came to an end in 2015. As for my pericoronial framing, this work of fiction by the Nobel Prize winning Chinese author not only reflects on the past, but also anticipates the future. Dealing with poverty, public health and protest, it prefigures our current health crisis. As with current lockdowns around the globe, Frog dramatizes debates around individual freedom versus collective health and well-being. Its present day section is set in 2004, just one year after the SARS outbreak that killed 349 people in China and almost 800 globally in 2003. In the novel, Mo Yan makes some prophetic pronouncements. For example, writing, it's the call of the party, a directed by Chairman Mao, national policy. Chairman Mao has said, mankind must control itself, end quote. Replace Mao with Xi Jinping and family planning with quarantine. And this reads not unlike the call for strict lockdown in Wuhan in 2020. Indeed, the author's words prove globally prescient as debates around mask wearing and limited movement spread far beyond China. Chinese literature tends to explore ways of life in a roundabout way and revealing the thematic metaphors employed helps to uncover the author's views for international readers. Mo Yan's ethic, aesthetics of indirection is revealed in Frog when he writes, a tortuous path leads to nirvana. Accordingly, the novel is layered within various veneers of diegetic and extra diegetic material. Frog is structured within a frame narrative, the frame encompassing Japanese occupation and issues around writing and narrative, as the narrator Tadpole works within epistory and metafictional traditions to write letters to a mysterious and revered sensei and to project the, pl fro the play named Frog with which the novel concludes. Mo Yan looks back as far as the mid 1950s, somewhat ironically cast in Frog as modern China's golden age, with the author describing a boom in births at this time of relative affluence. The novel then evokes the swift reversals to the nation's fortunes that took place in first the Great Famine that killed at least 36 million Chinese people in 59 to 61, and second, the cultural revolution of murder, rape, and public shamings. The novel contains visceral reflections on hunger, including characters eating grass, coal, and one even writes an, a lyrical essay, an ode to coal, on the fossil fuels, gustatory pleasures, as well as the titular frogs. Frogs aren't just nutritious though, but have fertility resonances. The sighting of these amphibians is supposed to herald the arrival of twins, children who are desired as they allow parents legitimate circumvention of the one child policy. Also sought after are boy babies for ingrained patriarchal and feudal reasons that are under reconstruction in communist China. If they aren't lucky enough to have twins, many parents choose to bring what is known as bootleg kids into the world. The rich paying hefty fines for exceeding the single child maximum, the poor hiding the very existence and therefore sacrificing the legal rights of these children. The narr narrator himself becomes entangled in these strictures as he ominously gets married in 1979 at the start of the one child policy and his first wife later dies having a termination at the hands of his aunt Gugu, a prolific IUD fitting and abortion giving nurse whose motto is family planning is party work. As the state deploys science to interfere in ordinary people's personal affairs, the novel veers into magical realist territory. 
we see the arrival of the sweet potato kids, a glut of children born after a bumper harvest of the root vegetable. And there is a, a craze for clay dolls or figurines that it is thought one can buy and then have the same kinds of babies. In this quote, world populated by errant knights, psychics, and some who conceal their faces, end quote. Readers encounter miraculous, dreamlike events, including late life pregnancies and lactating non-mothers, as folkloric and supernatural elements combine. Published nine years after Frog in 2018, the dissident author Ma Jian is preoccupied in his novel China Dreams with what Michael Rothberg calls multidirectional memory in the context of the Cultural Revolution and its post-traumatic afterlife. The novel opens in the dystopic mode with protagonist director Mao Dei Dei heading up the China Dream Bureau. There he is working to develop a device that deletes people's memories, including his own painful flashbacks to culpability in the Cultural Revolution's violence. The populace's hopes and dreams will be deleted by this chip, being replaced by the China Dream of Xi Jinping a future-facing, pasta-raising form of rampant consumerism. As part of his programme, Mao Deodei organises a large golden wedding celebration for couples who have been married 50 years. Yet he himself is an unrepentant womaniser, married but with at least 12 mistresses at any one time. This hallucinatory novel is punctuated by his conversations with his various lovers by SMS, WeChat, and the forwarding of the maxims and aphorisms of which he's so fond. Mao Dao Dei's own mantra becomes, you're not me, apropos of his younger self, as he keeps having flashbacks to his past in the 1960s. His intrusive memories consume him, despite his best efforts, to the extent that he loses his job and is regarded as a madman. His downward mobility is reflected in a formalist backward trajectory, as the novel transmogrifies from the dystopian technologized future into a sort of past orientated magical realism. Instead of a device or chip, Mao Dao Dei changes tack, trying to make a China dream broth or soup from mysterious and hard to gather ingredients like one drop of his mother's menstrual blood and another of his father's tears. Yet his parents are long dead by suicide, having imbibed pesticide to escape the ravages and social shaming of the Cultural Revolution. In this context, Mao Dao Dei longs for amnesia an escape from the increasingly intrusive thoughts about his violent existence in the rural China of the 1960s. However, he does worry about losing the last happy memories of his parents, even though he himself had earlier been content to prescribe the wiping of others' brains. The novel is rounded off by an excellent afterward in which Ma Jian writes of having been exiled from China for six years and notes that all utopias end up as dystopias. It is interesting to, that the Chinese... Um, get, Claire, if I may, I just need to yeah. um, give you a little time warning and bring us to, sure. to a close. So another, another yes, minute I'll bring or so it, I'll bring it to a close. I just want to close with a quotation written before the SARS-CoV pandemic. Um, oh, sorry. The novel was written before coronavirus, but here is Ma Jian in an excoriating op-ed in February this year about the pandemic. Xi Jinping's mishandling of the coronavirus epidemic must now be added to the party's list of shameful crimes. With serious outbreaks occurring in Japan, South Korea, Iran and Italy, it is clear that the virus of Xi's um, totalitarian rule threatens the health of freedoms, not only of the Chinese people, but all of us everywhere. So I was going to just come on to talk, to recap um, this idea that literature does possibly give the opportunity for empathy, um, but too often that is extolled and is maybe exaggerated, um, that the virus has not really been an equaliser. And just to point towards three um, world writers, Sadie Smith, Ellis Shafak and Arundhati Roy, major um, writers of colour who have all published non-fiction this year, reflecting on 2020, which I recommend to you very highly indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. Um, I'm sorry to, to have had to bring that to, to an early close. We now have an opportunity for questions to members of the, the panel. Um, and I'm going to use the chair's prerogative to open up here. Um, one of the effects, of course, of the pandemic has been to make everyone think more carefully about the relationship between humankind and the natural world. 
Um, and I wonder if any of our speakers would like to reflect on ways perhaps in which we may be seeing the evolution of a new, what we might describe as eco poetics as a result of the, the pandemic. How have we seen that emerge perhaps in, in recent literature or the other forms of writing and cultural production we've been hearing about? Um, I don't know if Claire, would you, would you like to kick off on that one? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's I'm sorry, I'm sorry David, just very quickly. Um, I, yeah. I just found this, this panel fascinating. And can I just suggest that we, we minimize the break in between uh, the panel and uh, the next keynote, so we can have 30, 30 minutes for discussion, please? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Claire. Yeah, I mean, I just quickly, um, it, very interesting question. Um, and definitely, I think it was so interesting to hear that point about, um, I think it was in Federico's presentation about um, the possibility of both and thinking, um, which is something that I've, I've seen come up a lot. And I think um, in regards to the environment, it was hard not to sort of feel some, you know, optimism when the world stopped and flights were grounded and, and nature was sort of coming back to cities and things. Um, and some people have, like the French, um, philosopher Bernard Henri Levy in his book about coronavirus said that that's obscene way to think and that there's the, the current crisis is an unmitigated disaster, which is a kind of rationalist approach. But I, I don't think that's true. I think it's possible to hold together both and thinking that yes, the virus, this pandemic is a disaster. And yes, it is also, there are also some benefits. Um, and I think that we will see um, writers turning to, to nature. I mean, it's already happening. There's a you know, big field of study of post-colonial um, eco-criticism that's, you know, that's looking at some fascinating work from around the globe. And I, I can only ma imagine that that's going to accelerate. In what I've read so far, it's very early days. And um, in the non-fiction that I flagged up on the final side by Zadie Smith, Ella Shafak and Aaron Dati Roy, all of them make gestures to the environment, but don't, don't go into detail. There's no kind of pastoral moments particularly, but someone like Aaron Dati Roy, um, she, she had the essay, um, which closes her book Azadi called The Pandemic is a Portal. And I think that, um, you know, in future um, writers might be thinking about how this pandemic can accelerate and, and allow us to make the world that we want to make. Thank you. Uh, would any of our other panelists like to comment on that? Uh, you see, yes. Yes, um, so I think um, the, the pandemic definitely makes um, the environmental issues um, appear. I mean, it was always there, but it just makes it more apparent to the live people. Um, but, and then for, I think in, in terms for the realm of curation and artistic creation, I think there's, I, I've seen also like an increasing attention on such topic. For example, I just saw the title of the Shanghai Biennale being the body of water, something like water related. So definitely environmental. But um, so, but I haven't seen that exhibition to be honest. But I so far found, like in terms of curating, um, it, it becomes a theme of an interest. But um, personally, I found uh, it's still remaining as a topical, like a like a phenomenon, like a hot topic. But for example, one thing I didn't see, and I hope that I could see, was. Um, the stop of production, which is environmental and reuse when we are still creating exhibitions and we're creating so much waste in terms of doing the production like papers and um, exhibition materials. And that's not something being really discussed and, and explored, but, um, but just mm -hmm. a theme and the concept as environmental is definitely prominent in, in the world of curation and art. It's very interesting to me to look at the absolutely horrific pictures of the treatment of mink in Denmark, which of course is now the, uh, the subject of a new outbreak fear because these mink appear to have transmitted a, a variant of the coronavirus. Uh, the really shocking thing about this was to see the conditions in which those poor animals were kept in the first place in tiny cages. Uh, so one might feel optimistic that this has highlighted issues of cruelty to animals as well as a, a broader understanding, if you like, of our dependence on, on raw materials. 
I wonder if there are any other points uh, arising from that, or would anyone like to ask another question of our panelists? May uh, I can, add something welcome. very, 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 very yeah. uh, rapidly? Uh, for sure, I think it's something that we're going to see in greater measure in the in the in the time to come. Because, um, for example, um, it really depends also in the in the context you're in. For example, at the beginning, I remember when uh, there was this big discussion about bats being the cause of the of the of the earlier outbreak. Um, there was some discussion on that and so on. Uh, wild systems of, um, na of, of, of natural exploitation. Um, there was something in Europe when, and, and specifically in Italy, when the, when the country was in lockdown and we saw nature reclaiming its spaces. And so there were people reflecting on that. I'm talking about artists now. Mm -hmm. um, um, and there's solar punk, for example, in science fiction. Solar punk is this attempt by science fiction to reason not to, to, to build not only a dystopian vision of the future, but also to think about how technology can actually help us to build a better future, not only a worse future. And so uh, I've heard some solar punk writers or, uh, or scholars um, pointing exactly in this direction, like pandemic is showing that we are right and there's a lot of potential in that direction. So I really, I'm really confident that we're going to see a lot of these eco poetry uh, variously intended in the years to come. Thank you, Federica. Any other points or any other questions? We have uh, Federica on the chat line, um, liking the idea of both and. May I ask a question using host's privilege? <laughs> Please, Lauren, go ahead. Um, Thanks so much. I hope, um, first of all, I just want to say I really enjoyed all of the presentations and I felt that one of the sort of undercurrents, sort of latent elements that um, were, were, was a strand that um, I, I, I intuited all the way through was um, part of my own research actually, which is surrealism. Um, surrealism on its most fundamental level sort of reconciles the individual and the collective um, through the dialectic that uh, Federico mentioned, um, Bien Zhang Fa. Um, and I think that if we look at it on its most fundamental level, post-socialism in China was a reconciliation of the individual and the collective and our uh, sort of a, a recognizing of our individual subjectivity. But that sort of this, that dialectic, I feel, has sort of been suspended in a way during the coronavirus due to the censorship of anything subjective. Um, the nurse's poem, um, for example, in um, uh, Federico's presentation. And there's also that bifurcation from surrealism as well in Claire's presentation uh, with the uh, magical realism, a sort of spiritual bifurcation from surrealism. Um, and also in Stephanie's presentation as well, Zhang Xiaogang um, has been inspired by René Magritte. And I think a lot of his work's dialectical as well. So um, I was just wondering if um, you had any comments on surrealism or the dialectic, any of the panelists? Who would like to open up on that? Right, I think, uh, thank you, Maureen. I think it's a great question, but it's also a complicated one, to be <laughs> honest. And my research, actually, you can see how interesting there is a uh, overlap between each other, you know, the literature, but also, you know, what, happen, ha what is happening in the reality. And my study is quite, you know, when I research about pharmacy and also the dual meaning about writing is not just writing, but also about artists to be a writer, you know? And uh, there are two things I think you you just remind me when I'm doing that. One thing is the, the metaphorical level of, you know, what are human beings, what we are, you know? And the question about just you, you mentioned about post post-socialism and surrealism and also about the existence of human beings. That's the point one. And the point two is gonna be the social memory. And how can we deal with our memory? You know, there are a lot of things happening every day. A lot of news, informations, you know, this is like, you know, come to us and they just yelling to us, you know, how can we solve the problem? We can't solve the problem, you know, we can't deal with ourselves. That's the I think that's the main problem we really need to face too. When I'm in the self-quarantine, but also when I'm 
as a researcher doing the, this project. And uh, then I found out one thing is really interesting. Um, because when I interviewed the three artists, they thought like uh, there is a huge difference between collective forgetting and the collective and anedia. You know what, what I mean, right? Because for, forgetting gonna be the passive forgetting, but also can be kind of um, active and a positive forgetting. But if we, um, you know, we, when we come to collective anedia, it's gonna be some kind of you know, we are forced to forget something what have already happened in the past. So there is a huge difference between these two. And I'm just, you know, working on that. I hope I can figure it out. But really, thank you, your question. Thank you, sir. Right. Mm. I'm, I'm rather drawn to thinking about the surreal in respect of that sort of vast body of underground cultural work, which is um, represented by conspiracy narratives. Obviously, these have become extremely popular as well um, in times of um, pandemic, as they, they always have been. Um, it's the kind of underbelly of Foucault's comment about the dream of literature, where we, during pandemic, we sort of imagine this crazy upside down world where um, the normal rules of reality are, are defied. Um, I wonder if anyone would like to comment on the, the sort of the cultural status of conspiracy writing, um, which, which, this, this surely is quite a significant part of the moment where we are. If I, if I may say something about this, but also about, about the real, because the, the two issues are together, I think, um, especially when you think of the limits of realism. So uh, not only in China, also elsewhere, uh, I mean, the discussion about what realism should include is not new, uh, about whether it should include only the plain real or also, for example, the reality of the mind. Um, and in the case of China, it is even more interesting because um, realism has been showing its limits for a long time. And especially now, something I see and some, something I would, be, I would be very, very interesting in analyzing further is that um, realism, the possibilities of realism have come to, um, to an even uh, more visible limits because spaces for creative uh, intervention on the real are becoming increasingly narrow, especially uh, during, during the last decade. So writers and also artists are using different alternative forms to talk about the real. So for example, in literature, we talk of uh, hyper-realism, exactly to address reality from a more nuanced perspective. And when it comes to conspiracy, for example, so in, in, in the narratives, in the poetry, but also prose, I've tried to, to analyze um, from the very, very early, uh, from the very first months of the epidemic outbreak in China, something you see uh, again, is not really plain, uh, is, is, is not explicit critique, but then you have these empty streets, this silence, etc. And if you analyze these works from an aesthetic point of view, because of, of course they're also socially relevant, but we, sh we should never forget, I think, the, also uh, uh, an, uh, an analysis from an aesthetic perspective, because that's, that's exactly what allows you to see how this critique if it's there, is unfolded. For example, silence can, can also be um, a way of, of uh, uh, creatively uh, reflecting on what's going on, especially in a moment when there's not silence, there's, there's the claim of, of slogans and of, of the people's war and total mobilization. So if you concentrate on silence, that's a, precisely, that's a precise choice in another direction. And conspiracy, for example, I remember reading um, a poem by another migrant laborer uh, um, uh, stranded at home and he, uh, because, you know, of course, fake news were ubiquitous also in China at the beginning. And, and, and also Li Wenliang's case shows that how, how we can also, I mean, how the idea of fake news can also be used at the expense of real news, right? Mm. Um, and I remember reading a poem about this migrant laborer who um, joked precisely on this fake news. So he um, um, 
wrote about all the um, rumors he would hear uh, at his home village about how the virus spread. And there were all sorts of <laughs> wild and very inventive rumors around. But then he says, uh, so yeah, we, we are just spreading rumors perhaps, but the point is we don't know what's happening. Yeah. So in that case, conspiracy uh, is um, read in a different way. So uh, it's actually, uh, th there's, there's um, um, a reflection on how conspiracy spreads also because there's bewilderment, bewilderment. there's confusion about what's happening. And that's especially true for systems where there's no uh, free circulation of information. One of the oldest um, conventions of plague writing, of course, is to compare um, viruses to rumor itself. Rumor becomes a virus, naturally, yes. Um, do we have any other questions from the floor or observations from panel? Claire, yes. Yeah, no, it's a really good good discussion, Liz. Um, I think this idea of surrealism might be more useful to me than magical realism. I've been struggling to find the words for the Chinese texts at least, which are quite new to me. Um, you know, they blend folklore and, um, you know, surrealism definitely plays a part in both the novels I looked at, and especially in China Dream, there's a prostitute scene where there's kind of an orgy with these women dressing, dressing up as red guards and the Mao Dao Day character sort of drunken and, and it's, there's all the dream aspects that come in, you know, a lot in the novel that makes, makes it hard to sort of separate the real from the surreal. And linking that, I mean, I agree with Federico that these things are closely linked when you br brought up conspiracy theories, it does kind of link to this surrealism mode. In Pakistan, which is what I really know, um, there's been all, sort, there's always conspiracy theories with the virus. Um, there's been rumors that it's not real or that it is um, it is real, but it's targeting Muslims and stopping them from their worship. There's been, you know, words to that effect. And, but in, in the case of Pakistan, you know, the truth is often stranger than the rumors. Um, so for example, the, there were always rumors that polio vaccinations in you know 10 15 years ago in the northwest of the country was a conspiracy um to emasculate a uh, muslim uh, muslims and, and you know mm. stop families from you know reproducing but actually the cia had been using polio vaccination programs as cover for investigating the um khyber pakhtunkhwa region so you know, no wonder, you know, so rumours had their, had their basis in some fact that they, they got the wrong end of the stick. Um, and I, I agree with Federico that in this world, this 2020 world, that realism just is completely in inadequate to talk about such things. Um, when you talked about the empty streets and silence, Zadie Smith in her book, which I wasn't able to talk about because of my time mismanagement, um, she talks about what it must be like for people with florid mental illness at this time. But the thing that they've always feared is here. You know, you imagine that devastation and a world coming to an end in empty streets. And what must it be like if you if you don't adequately understand day to day life to, to actually see this cataclysmic event? So she talks very powerfully about that. So I think that another trend that we're starting to see is and I think we're seeing that in the presentations is, you know, mental health. Um, you know, fake news, rumour, and how this can kind of disturb the mind. An interesting post here from, from Louise, um, which is really, I, I guess, about this the experience of um, migration, of being displaced by coronavirus, which is, I guess, the other half of the equation here, isn't it? We, we think partly of the effect of virus as being locked in our own homes, but of course, but for millions of people, it's an experience of being if you like, in a semi-permanent state of exile. And Louise draws our attention to uh, the artist Xu Fei Detz, currently based in Berlin, unable to return to Australia due to the first lockdown. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, thank sure, you. Sure. Uh, hi. Um, thank you uh, for all the speakers. Um, and um, I've got uh, two observations slash questions, one derived from uh, Federico's talk, uh, the other derived from a number of talks that we, we, we share. Um, 
from the Federico one, um, uh, I was fascinated by, about those kind of um, Chinese slogans uh, in rhyme. Uh, the one that um, you, you in your on your PowerPoint, which was called Zhao Ni Bu Dai Bing Du Ba Ni Ai, it's like if you don't wear the face mask, um, uh, the virus will fall in love with you. Um, and um, I, I think the making those slogans in rhyme is trying to increase the accessibility to, to the public, I guess, and particularly those uh, who um, have less education or they, they can memorize things easily. But at the same time, that when you making such a serious issue rhyme, would that reduce the seriousness or undermine the seriousness of the message? Um, this, is, this is really purely to do with uh, with uh, the, uh, the the literature and um, uh, this is beyond my area and would like to hear colleagues view uh, on that. Um, the other point that I was going to make is that um, I really like um, the the, uh, the presentation from uh, Yu Si um, and uh, the uh, and we were, we were talking about how you actually record um, uh, your experience and also uh, the uh, the presentation from uh, uh, from Stephanie um, and including Liu Xiaodong's painting as well as um, uh, Yan's um, the, the writing and painting and when you see the writing um, itself it's not typing it's 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 proper writing and I'm amazed by this Yen's handwriting uh, at this young age. You know, it's it's a beautiful writing, and the writing itself actually materialized the literature in a way. And it's it's not record the thinking itself, but also record the process of the thinking. Whilst um, the the typing is a kind of recorded form of the thinking. So you, it's an edited version that you don't see the mistakes, you don't see um, uh, the, uh, um, the errors of, uh, of grammar, for example. Um, so there's two types of things. And uh, the, the, the latter one, which is um, writing itself, um, it's a kind of more genuine in a way, it's, it's more true in a way, in, in terms of literature, as well as uh, painting. Um, I doubt it whether Liu Xiaodong uh, painted um, uh, Liu Wa and uh, Yu Hong, his wife, on spot, or painted a photograph. If it's the latter, it's a fake. You know, it's 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 not true. So uh, when we're talking about recording the experience of the pandemic, um, I think these things um, come into play and and let us to rethink about the ways in which that we 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 record um, our expressions. Anyone like to comment on that? I can say something very swiftly about slogans and the rhymes. Uh, I'm not an expert in, I don't know, propaganda studies, <laughs> but uh, um, I think this is part, so there's a lot of actually a huge range of slogans that were produced um, after the Wuhan lockdown um, and over that period. And some of them are much duller and much more monotonous than, than the one I showed. Um, I think it has to do with making it really pervasive. So you have the more serious slogans on the one hand, and then you have rhymes, then you have slogans to somehow play with language uh, to make it. I'm not sure if it makes it more accessible. It just Perhaps it was just a way to spread it, to, to make it ubiquitous, to make it appear everywhere and not to make it too dull. Um, because then you see it also with poetry, right? Also, also in some cases, also poetry, also arts became nothing more than um, uh, slogans in verses or slogans in painting also. For example, uh, over, the, over the presentation, I showed some works of art that were produced during the period because this idea of total mobilization also actually involved artists, right? So there were a lot of artists who were producing artworks, paintings that were no different from uh, posters you would see of the warriors in white coats, right? So perhaps it, it, has, it has to do with that, just to 
spread the message as, as, as much as possible. But I, I mean, it's it's not a specialist answer. It's just my 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 uh, opinion on on on, on this. Yeah. Uh, thank you. There's, there's a well-established link, of course, between rhyming and mnemonics, isn't there? <clears throat> Stephanie, you wanted to yeah. come in there. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for Professor John's question. It's great, but but I don't think Liu Xiaodong's work could be fake, to be honest, you know. But I, I know what you mean. There are totally two different ways of writing, you know, in terms of their purpose, the way they use, and the computer, you know, versus handwriting, uh, etc. Uh, but for me, you know, the, the most fascinating point for this comparative study uh, to do three artists is that you can see how the writer, the so-called writer, the artist as a narrator, how they record their life, you know, during the pandemic. Maybe they're gonna, you know, tell some fake things, you know, of course, maybe they're gonna imagine about their audience, especially as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Professor Zhang, you are definitely gonna think about the audience who gonna buy um, his painting. Of course, the thing's gonna sell in the listen gallery, right? What? Otherwise, he will not paint such so much small little paintings. And you know, in art market, small little paintings always appealing to the small and the bourgeois collectors, you know, because they can't afford the, the larger size. But anyway, yeah, I think that's interesting for me, you know, to not to tell which is true, which is fake, you know, but to see how they treat, you know, as a um, narrator to raise up the question and to solve their kind of daily lives problem because there are so many things coming through during the pandemic. Um, and also, you know, if, I don't want to say which artist I prefer and which artist is my favorite, but to be honest, I always think no matter the reader or Foucault and also maybe just like Deleuze, they talk a lot of things about writing. And the two, if you use that, that uh, theoretical things to analyze these three artists, it's not gonna work, but you need to see them clearly, how they write things from the text, but also how they feel things, how they compare to each other. And I think this is the fascinating point for me. I don't know if I answer your question, but maybe you can you know, ask more, right? Thank you, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> right. Joshua, I'm, I'm mindful of the need to create a small break before the next keynote um, in, in case people need it for whatever reason. So if I may, I will just thank all of our panelists, Federico, Stephanie, UC, and Claire, um, for a fascinating series of papers and a very good discussion afterwards. It's been a pleasure to meet you all virtually. I hope one day I might meet you in person. Um, I'm going to hand back now to uh, Joshua and to Lauren. Thank, thank you, you, David. Thank you for your um... Um, uh, chairing the um, um, the session, it's 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 just fascinating. And um, uh, Lauren, um, do you want to say anything, or we have uh, a quick break? Oh, one thing that I would like to say is that, including the chair and and uh, the panelists in the morning, um, can we just invite you if you are staying in the afternoon as well? In particular, uh, uh, just uh, at the uh, um, finishing point at three o'clock UK time, 11 o'clock China time, that we will have a virtual drink uh, session. So at this point that we can uh, open up our mics and we can talk to each other um, and uh, we, we celebrate in that way. Uh, so please join us if you can. Thank you, Joshua. So yes, um, we we we'll, um, we know that our next um, keynote speaker, Bo Zheng, um, will be coming online very shortly. So um, please just take this um, five minutes uh, for yourselves, just to get a bit of um, uh, time away from the screen, and we'll see you sharp at eleven. Thanks so much. Okay, we will get back in five minutes' time. Make a tea. <laughs>
Hi, Bo. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? Good, can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. And Bo, do I remember correctly if you had a PowerPoint for today? Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. So we're almost on time. Um, mm -hmm. If we start in about one minute, we just had a five minute break. Sure. Should I start sharing the screen? Um, no, we'll just wait for Joshua to introduce you. Joshua? I see. Sorry, I'm coming. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Hi, good morning. Hello. Hello, hi. Hello. Hi, um, thank you very much, much for joining us uh, this morning as a keynote. And I know that you're in Berlin um, and um, it's 12 o'clock for you. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Zheng Bo is Associate Professor in City University of Hong Kong. And I remember the day that uh, we did the uh, Thailand Biennale, uh, how we discussed our proposal over a pint of beer next to the swimming pool. Um, and um, in Thailand, you discussed with the villagers and how do you use the uh, plant to make your artwork. And I'm sure you will share with us more about your understanding about the, um, uh, your, your artistic practice. So over to you, Jumbo. Okay, great. Thank you for inviting me and I will start sharing the screen. So the title of the presentation is The Soft and the Weak Are Companions of Life. This is a um, translation of the Taoist um, phrase, okay. The COVID-19 pandemic has achieved what many human environmental activists have failed to do over the past 50 years since Earth Day was first celebrated in 1970. Factories were shut, flights were canceled, people stayed home, tended gardens and went hiking when possible. Many of us came to the same conclusion that it is okay to do less. So the first project I will just briefly describe is precisely in Thailand the exhibition curated by Professor Jiang uh, two years ago. The, it was an installation in a um, national park. Um, so it's, I'll just go through the images. So life is hard. Why do we make it so easy. Okay. So it's been um, it's been interesting to actually look at this work. Um, it was done two years ago. Of course, it's a very different time for the humans, and the. It, it's an installation with uh, orchids in Thailand. Uh, I worked with the local uh, orchid grower community. They grow these orchids and they, they, they sell half of the orchids to sustain themselves. And then they put the other half back into the forest because they said in the forest in Thailand, there used to be a lot of orchids before and then people still, humans still all the orchids. So, now the forests are flowerless. So now they're putting these orchids back. Um, when I learned that I could do something in this national park, I thought, so why not just use some money from Hong Kong? The project was uh, supported by the Arts Development Council in Hong Kong. 
So I thought, why not just use some money in Hong Kong to support the orchid grower community? And so this, this is, I mean, it's my idea, but the installation was done completely by the local orchid uh, grower community. This is one way to put the flowers back into the forest, but of course it's also to make uh, artwork uh, for the biennial. The statement, life is hard, why do we make it so easy, was sort of a, a twist on a TED talk. The original talk, the title was, life is easy, why do we make it so hard? So the talk was given by a Thai farmer. He, his point was, you know, as a farmer, he can live a relatively comfortable life. So why does he have to go to Bangkok as uh, migrant labor? When I, the, the talk was very popular on TED, but when I uh, heard it, I also thought it's more of an um, anthropocentric perspective. So when we talk about life, is it about human life? Is it about migrants' life? Is it about life in general of the 10,000 beings on earth? So I also wanted to broaden the statement by flipping the sentence around. I think it's interesting for me even to look at this work now after two years because I didn't expect that even for humans that we will encounter something as difficult as this year. But of course, the pandemic is only part of the larger ecological crisis and life has been very hard for many other species, you know, um, probably all the non-humans and many of the humans already before this pandemic, it, except this pandemic now is affecting the global population. Um, so it's, it's a different situation. So among the lessons that the virus has taught us, tragically, is that we cannot continue living in the fantasy that we own this planet. We do not. We account for only 0.01% of the total biomass on Earth. So here, this is a work I did last year in Hong Kong. Uh, again, it's, um, it's a text planted with uh, plants. Um, you are the 0.01%. Uh, this is based on a research publication in, the, um, in a science journal. Um, the researchers study the biomass on earth and humans only account for 0.01% of the total biomass on planet earth. But of course we use um, half of the land. We also use 30% of the primary energy produced by all beings on earth. I planted this in oil art space in North Point in Hong Kong. Ne actually next to this art space is a building uh, actually in construction. It's a hotel set up uh, newly built by Li ka -shing. And as many of you probably know, he's the richest person in Hong Kong. So this also sort of reflects on the human equality issue as many of but probably know the where the 99% has been a slogan since Occupy Wall Street. But I wanted to connect the, um, the human inequality that we are 99% with the ecological situation that humans, as humans, we only account for 0.01% of the biomass. So on, on one hand, perhaps many of us belong to the 99%, but on the other hand, we also belong to the 0.01%. I think what I also learned, um, you know, we can talk about this in the Q&A as well. What I also learned this year is perhaps even when we address the climate emergency, we cannot go alone as one single species. Perhaps even in addressing climate change and ecological meltdown, we really have to think about uh, interspecies collaboration. So I started working with plants seven years ago. Um, 
So people often ask me how I started to migrate from social practice to ecological practice. My honest reply, it was not decided by me. It was really a patch of vibrant weeds in Shanghai at the Shanghai Cement Factory, now known as the West Bund, that woke me up in the summer of 2013. So this is the patch of weeds that I'm, I'm marking on Google map. So this site was the Shanghai Cement Factory. It was built in the 1920s along the river. Uh, so it's, it's uh, convenient for shipping. So this is the patch of weeds I encountered in the summer of 2013. I was really shocked because it's quite central in Shanghai. I was not expecting to see such a vibrant habitat in the center of Shanghai. I was there looking for indoor space to show a video work. But when I encountered this patch of weeds, I was really taken by it and decided to work with this. So this is how I sort of transitioned from socially engaged art to ecological practice. Um, it's, it's not a decision made solely by myself. So some of you may already know this work, so I'll just go through this very quickly, so I won't dwell on this. So we identified the weeds in this site. We also decided to build an online course. Uh, I was interested in online uh, education at the time um, to make it not, not a global situation, but more of a local situation, and also thinking about uh, online offline integration. So we created an online course with uh, local scholars in Shanghai. We did uh, eight lectures and then that corresponded with the exhibition period. So every week, one person will give a lecture online. And then on the weekend, we'll actually do on-site activities at, the, at, at West Bund. Related to uh, plants, but also we approach plants in different, uh, through different disciplines, from lit literary studies to cultural studies to um, urban studies, et cetera. So since this project, I try, of course, as to the extent possible to claim only half of the credit for everything I do. So um, plants, of course, um, account for the other half of the credit. They actually sculpt and play and I can live and breathe. So many of us in the art world have long abandoned the, the genius trope invented by the 16th century writer, Giorgio Vasari. Now it is time for one further step to abandon the creationist myth of our making. We are not created by God and we do not create like God. Without trees, spiders and whales, we would never be able to make art. We are inspired by patterns, stories, and ideas that originate in the complex and beautiful web of life on this planet. In 2016, uh, so this is what I'm, so just a couple of examples about this idea that plants actually sculpt. So maybe this is a project that some people know this is a work I did in Nanjing at the Sifang Art Museum. This is the original um, project. When we first started, I made these two triangles on the roof of the museum uh, with weeds from the surrounding areas um, because the, you can see there are sort of a middle-class residential projects around this area. And then the, during construction, weeds pop up but after the construction, they always put uh, grass because people want grass rather than weeds to signify a certain class identity. So we transform the weeds during the construction period onto the roof of the museum. So later on the kids from these neighborhoods, they can come to the museum to learn the weeds um, as a as sort of in a botanical garden. But there's a twist because when, after we, we put the, um, the after we transplanted the weeds, we don't intervene. So the, of course, weeds start to spread. After, you know, I went back, so the shape has complete picture. Um, 
I need to go back again. But the the tri the two triangles actually are not so clean anymore because we they evade they 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 play they sculpt. So the the shapes are now um, sort of transforming um, into the light and shadow situation because when there's light the weeds grow better. So it's also corresponding to the the light and shadow created by the architecture. Joshua, is the internet clear enough? Um, um, it's a kind of, um, there is a, a bit hiccup during your talk, but it's it's probably gonna be fine. And everyone else, do you find the problem? Um, Oh, Hongwei says fine. Hongwei says fine. Okay. Just, just yeah. go. okay. If there is yeah. a, if, if there is any uh, a further problem, uh, if I may, I will stop you and uh, I will. Yes. I will yeah, you. because something popped up on my screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is a uh, show the images. This this is kind of a weeds garden in um, the UCCA, uh, their new branch in Beidaihe. So again, I worked with the local farmers to transplant weeds into this little garden outside the museum. So this is a project in UK where uh, we planted the Socialism Good Slogan in 2016. This is uh, curated by Winnie and Claire at the Cass Sculpture Foundation. Um, so after we planted, the, the, the weeds also popped up after two weeks. Um, so they also changed the, how the slogan is perceived. Okay. So in 2016, a botanist took me to a forest on the edge of Taipei, where scientists like him study ferns. Since then, I have been going there every year to make one short ecosexual film. I look forward to this annual ritual because the air in the forest is so invigorating. Half awake, we usually go up to, the, uh, to this place in the early morning. Usually, you know, we artists are not early arisers. But once we are in the forest, bathing in a sea of oxygen and phytoncides, our bodies and minds reach a heightened level of agility and attentiveness. Plants reveal to us the full potential of a three-dimensional space. Massive bird's nest ferns perch on trees, tiny moss blanket rockets. The light is dramatic, the sound is rich, and the aroma intense. The assemblage has a distinct style, yet it's constantly changing. This forest is better than any artwork I could ever make and better than any exhibition I have ever seen. This series of eco-sexual films, it's, um, I title it uh, Turidophilia, portrays intimate encounters between local ferns and local men. So this is from part one. Uh, because of the internet, I mean, I usually will screen something, but because of the internet connection, I'll just show um, still images. If, if people are interested, you can send me email, I'll send you the link to watch. So this is part one, this is made in 2016 with uh, six performers and, um, you know, they, they come from different walks of life in Taiwan, uh, from psychologist to uh, travel agent to theater actors. So he's a theater, this, this performer is a theater student from Taipei National University. In two years, in 2018, I made the second part. Um, this performer, he's quite interesting. He didn't finish high school in Tainan and he decided to go to Taipei and joined an independent theater, Guling Jie Xiao Ju Chang. So he never went to university and was quite um, radical in the independent theater scene. So he was really um, intense. And the fern he's playing with is the bird's nest. So for people who go to Taiwan, 
If you go to a Hakka restaurant, they will serve this dish. You can eat the young leaves. Um, people in Taiwan will call it um, Shan Su, Shan Su Hua. They don't say Niao Chao Jue, they, they say uh, Shan Su Hua. So you can actually eat it. So in the film, um, he starts to have very passionate sex and then he starts eating the plant. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the connection between um, sex and eating and also our ethical attitude towards plants in different, um, in different relations. So part three, I worked with um, three people who really enjoy SM sex. So they're not performers, they, they, they enjoy SM sex in their own life. <clears throat> so we were trying to explore whether there's a SM potential with ferns in Taiwan. Uh, of course, there's also a lot of challenge because what we consider pleasure and pain, how do we, how do we understand that from the plant's perspective? And of course, I mean, I also learned uh, from, uh, maybe people don't know, there are actually ferns with uh, thorns. So, you know, I, this is the third time I went to the forest. Um, the first two times I never noticed there are actually ferns with very pointed thorns. But of course, when we start to think about SM potential, we notice there are uh, plants with thorns, uh, there are uh, ferns with thorns. So it really depends on what we are looking for. So this is the last um, chapter I did for uh, Taipei Banyu last year. So two younger performers um, playing with the young leaves, the fronds of ferns because the, as humans, we have been fascinated by these patterns. Like many of you probably know, the violins are inspired by uh, this form, um, the fiddlehead of young ferns. So this project is still going on. I'm actually supposed to go to Taiwan this year to make part five for the Liverpool Banyu, but I, because of the COVID-19, I not, able to travel, so I'll try to do it next year. Um, and also the local Banyu has been delayed until March next year. So this series of eco-sexual films portray intimate encounters between local ferns and local men. I won't go into the detail of the history of ferns in Taiwan. If, you know, if there are questions, I can also explain the connection between ferns and the colonial history in Taiwan. I really do not know how I came up with this idea for this project. I remember it was very difficult to explain it to others until the first episode was produced. Then last year, I stumbled on YouTube, a video filmed in New South Wales, Australia, by ecologist Colin Bauer, showing a wasp. The Latin name is um, Lysopenia excelsa, it's also called the orchid dupe wasp, passionately humping a tongue orchid. Okay, so um, I'm not playing the YouTube video, but you can easily look up these names and you can watch the, the clip on YouTube. Um, and there are also other YouTube videos uh, filmed both in Australia and in Italy uh, showing different kinds of bees and wasps having intercourse with orchids. Um, these orchids belong to one, um, one group and they are usually called tongue orchids because they have a very long petal. And the wasp, the common name for the wasp is orchid dupe wasp because for some reason, you know, I can also get into this, we can also talk about this, um, how as humans in this particular situation, we ascribe more intelligence and more agency to the orchids, to the animal species, uh, to, to the plant species, rather than the, uh, the animal species. In most situations, as humans, we ascribe more agency and intelligence to animals than to plants. So there's an interesting flip here. So when I saw this YouTube clip, I thought, Wow, this is just like my film. 
or actually more accurately, my film is just like this earthly wonder termed by human biologist pseudo copulation. In both instances, an animal and a plant are engaged in an interspecies sexual performance. The most imaginative idea in my whole artistic career was proven to be nothing original. I was simply following orchids and wasps. We stand not on the shoulders of giants, but in billions of years of evolution. So this is how um, I have shown this work in the Yokohama Triennial this year. So on one side of the screen, you see my film, and on the other side of the screen, you see the clips um, filmed by scientists in Australia and uh, Italy. And you notice there's a small print also on the wall. Um, it's, a, it's this print, uh, it's Takoto Ama by Hokusai, the Japanese, a very famous Japanese um, printmaker. And you can see, of course, it's um, human having sex with two octopuses. So this is, a, this is a print very well known in Japan and also elsewhere. I'm trying to incorporate it into this project to see that, of course, interspecies sex exists in nature. It has existed in, in the art history and also I'm making a new interpretation of it. So being overrun by flowers and insects does not mean that we should just give up and do nothing. I learned recently from reading philosophers Roger Ames and David Hall's translation of Gao De Jing, that Wu Wei, they translated Wu Wei as um, instead of not, rather than no action or none action, they translated Wu Wei as non-coercive action that is in accordance with the duo of things, the focus of things. Conservation scientists have also shown that human participants, us, when we practice things wisely, we can actually contribute to biodiversity. So it's not everything we do is wrong. It really depends on how we do things. A 2019 study concludes the areas managed by indigenous communities in Australia, Brazil, and Canada have similar levels of vertebrate biodiversity to that of nature reserves. So when people live in certain, in, in these um, um, areas, if we do the right thing, the biodiversity does not decrease. There are also other studies showing that Native Americans have been able to increase biodiversity of trees in forests in North America. So it really depends on whether we work with other beings in the planetary garden or exploit them until we all drop dead in the capitalist market. So it is time that we define art, not as human only creation, but the vibrancy of 10,000 things. So I'll show two more recent projects and then we can um, get into discussion. I think this, in discussion, maybe more um, points can be raised. So I was invited to Kyoto last year <clears throat> to show existing work, but I, I also learned um, um, that the, I was invited by the Kyoto City University of Arts to do an exhibition. But I also learned that the city, uh, the, the Kyoto City University of Arts is moving to a different area in Kyoto. And this area is called Sujin. So I'm showing historical maps of, the, of this area in Kyoto. Um, what's unique about this area is it's, it's a place where uh, Blakumin sort of migrant uh, workers who are considered the lowest in Japanese society live. So the term in Japanese is uh, in Chinese is uh, um, 
kind of like the untouchables in the Indian caste um, tradition. So it's people who are butchers who work with animals and also people who work with plants like um, gardeners. So they are considered the lowest ranks of the Japanese society and they live, they live in this area and they've been kicked around in, um, in different cities. So in Kyoto, if you go to Kyoto next time, I, I, if you have interest, you can visit. The Chinese name is uh, Chong Ren, Chong Gao de Chong, uh, Ren Si de Ren. In Japanese, it's Su Jin. So these are historical maps of the area. Um, so I'm showing very long history. So this is where the, the local um, migrant communities decided to build their own primary school. So it's kind of interesting kind of like the Pichun situation in Beijing, the migrant workers in Beijing building their own primary school. But this is in, um, this is in 1876. So they decided to build their own primary school as a community. Um, and then, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people have graduated from this primary school. So I'm showing historical graphs of the primary school. <clears throat> And he, this guy, 1920, he's a very instrumental uh, principal and also community leader in the area. And he really brought in uh, very innovative education uh, with both physical training, but also farming into the primary school. And in 1922, a very important, a very historical event actually happened in Kyoto, partly related to this area. Um, so that you can read the Chinese, uh, it says 全国, 全国水平社, in Japanese it's uh, 水海上, means uh, um, it's, it, it's a term that they use to translate equality. So it's equality like water. Okay. So this is, you can sort of see this as their civil rights movement in Japan in 1922. They got together with different um, discriminated communities in Japan and they actually wrote a manifesto. So this is a 1922 Shui Hasha manifesto. It's in every um, middle, a sort of high school textbook in Japan. So everyone in Japan learned about this in their high school. So it's related to this uh, neighborhood. <clears throat> so this is, they called for equality among all humans in Japan. So these are, photographs since then. So this is the 1960s. So it's still sort of a slum area and then it's transformed into public housing in the 1970s and 80s. Um, so there's also sort of a left-wing government trying to do social experiments to, to set up a public housing in this area. But for multiple reasons, it was considered a failure. But of course, like many public housing projects, um, it's a combination of um, deliberate, uh, deliberate sabotage and also the difficulty of um, competition of different areas with a private real estate. And this picture, you can see clearly the neighborhood is next to the Kamo River, the main river that runs through Kyoto, right? So whenever you have river, you have a lot of birds. <clears throat> So these are pictures that uh, uh, contemporary photographers have taken showing the neighborhood now. So when I went there last year, it's very, I mean, it, it's very different from the other areas of Kyoto. It's right next to the Kyoto train station. Uh, it's very, you know, if you get out of the train station, it's, it's crowded, it's busy. As soon as you get into this neighborhood, it just be complete, it becomes completely quiet. Uh, very few people are walking around and you can see buildings with fences. Okay. Because even today people, the mainstream society still consider this area undesirable. I was given an example, if someone is dating a person living in this area, that uh, the, the, the person who's not living there, he, uh, his parents or her parents will still object to the relationship. And this project was, um, the pictures I'm showing you is a booklet that we're making, but it's taking a long time to make this because it's highly sensitive in Japan. I think 
it's difficult for me to to understand the sensitivity, but it's um, I, I kept being actually instructed by the local community that this, this is highly sensitive in Japan. So it's a rundown area and then a lot of uh, public housing now are being transformed. A lot of weeds are growing again because things are disturbed. Um, it, the neighborhood used to have 10,000 people. Now it's been reduced to 1,000. The Kyoto City University of Arts is being moved to this area because the current mayor wants to revitalize this area. So it's, a, it's one of the typical strategies to bring in art. So when I got introduced to this neighborhood and to this particular situation, I thought, okay, there's something really interesting because human population is going down. And this site is next to a river where many birds are um, also living there. And I was also told that um, if the natural condition is right, the giant salamanders will come from the mountain area all the way into the city through the river. And also, of course, there are many weeds growing in this area. So I decided to do, I decided to, to organize a workshop with local young artists and community members to update the 1922 uh, manifesto, which was about human equality. So we spent three days, uh, also that it happened in a primary school that's no longer being used. So uh, this is the main community organizer. He's an acupuncturist and he also runs a local museum. He's very instrumental. So he's one of the participants in the workshop. Um, these, this picture shows young artists because I thought I was just there for, for a residency. So when I leave, it's better that if these young artists will continue to do something. So we did, um, you know, each person created a lesson so we can learn from each other, both intellectually, but also physically. And we went also on a hike to see different species. And then we, we came, after three days, uh, we had two versions of the manifesto. So all the, this is the, all the participants. So these are the two manifestos we wrote. Uh, it's in Japanese with uh, English translation. So both groups, of course, um, after the workshop, we wanted to create a manifesto to think about uh, multi-species equality, not only human equality, but multi-species equality. We had two versions because the, the, we organized two generations, people in their 40s, 50s, uh, like me, we wrote one version and the younger artists wrote another version. So this is the second version the younger artists wrote. So I'm hoping this will um, continue. As um, just one sort of concrete example, one of the artists, um, the artist seen here, she, she's writing one of the manifesto. She's a Japanese paint. She's a sort of a Japanese traditional painter. Um, now she's, painting plants also in the neighborhood. So that's what I did last year. And then uh, just what I've been doing this year, I'm, um, since I couldn't travel anymore, which in a way it's a good thing, both for myself, but also for, for my own footprint. So since April 19 this year, I've been uh, drawing plants. Um, every day. So I, you know, when I was in Hong Kong, I would go up, I live in the village on Lantau Island. So there's a hill behind my village. So I would just go up in the morning to draw plants. So every morning I go up and do one drawing. Um, it's, it's really, I mean, for me, it's really not about um, drawing itself. It's really about spending time with uh, plants and just to, to spend time in, in, in the hill. So I started in April 19, and I came to Berlin on August 6, on the beginning of summer, Li Xia. So I've been drawing every day in Berlin. Of course, the plans are very different in Berlin. Okay, so I'm showing a few images here. Um, and also in Berlin, I started to talk to scientists 
to think about approaching plants on their own terms, because many of the projects I've been doing over the past few years are really thinking about how plants are entangled in human political history, right? So, you know, socialism good, uh, life is hard, etc. So um, it's still sort of seeing plants from our perspective and uh, try to see how, what role they played in colonial history, in, um, in Chinese communist history, etc. So this year I wanted to kind of look at how plants practice politics on their own. So I've been talking to scientists to um, try to get inspired from their scientific research, mainly plant biologists and ecologists. This is still ongoing. I just had a um, um, public forum online last um, Saturday with three scientists. I can share some details if people are interested later in the discussion. Okay. So this is a new project. Um, I'm making a short film. Hopefully it will be shown next year. Um, it, so this is a new project. Of course, the, the, the eco-sexual film in Taiwan is still going. I'm still drawing. I'm still prob, you know, I'm making the life is hard. Why do we make it so easy in Hong Kong? Recreating this installation in Hong Kong. So these are projects that are, that are, that are uh, going on at the same time. A couple of years ago, I felt a bit uncomfortable because I realized my projects take different, many different forms. And I tend to sort of drag on and then they never really complete. But after thinking about this for a little while, I realized maybe this is better. Maybe this is, I'm starting to really um, practice my profession ecologically in a sense that each, each project is like a little plant. I'm cultivating a garden. So these different projects grow at different pace. And also they are subject not only to my will, they are subject to the time of the year, the season, the conditions created by both nat natural and cultural um, um, institutions. And these different plants, they entangle, they, they come across, they overlap. It's not so clean, but I think cleanness is probably the wrong way to go these days. Okay. So I'll stop here and I look forward to a discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim Bo. Um, it's really interesting to hear the whole range of your practice and um, um, including the, uh, the earlier work as well as the most uh, updated, most recent work um, all around uh, your um, artistic practice and thinking around the nature. Um, I, I might just take the liberty of uh, being uh, the, uh, the host here uh, to share some of my uh, observations and then we can open uh, the questions um, to the floor. Um, I think in terms of the pandemic, I, I call it a kind of pandemic pause uh, when um, you know we can't travel and we have to uh, quarantine at home, stay at home. Uh, we have to um, you know be still. Um, I haven't been traveling and flying for many, many months now. Um, and then you kind of you notice, uh, things that you didn't notice around you, including um, you know plants and animals, and we can see that because of the pandemic, uh, the traffic get uh, less um, busy, and you can see uh, the sky turning blue again, and you can see uh, the the pollution um, goes away slightly. So these are all uh, the uh, the pandemic uh, brought to us. Um, the other thing that I, I, I feel that from your um, talk, um, inevitably that uh, uh, as a, as a uh, Chinese uh, people, we think about um, the literati uh, art and culture uh, quite, uh, um, quite immediately. Um, and the way in which that uh, many, many years ago in uh, dynastic, uh, dynastic period, how literati artists um, they observe nature and how do they treasure uh, nature. And this is very different with uh, the culture in the West. For example, that um, uh, we here, people 
uh, observe nature in details as well. And we call it jing wu, uh, uh, hua hua jing wu, still life, but essentially they are dead life. They are, they are uh, flowers in the vase, for example, or dead animals on the, uh, put on the table for people to, to observe and, and artistically interpret. Um, but in China, you, you, you go into the forest um, and you observe flowers in such a great details. For example, the, uh, the Song Dynasty um, um, fan painting, you know, you, Gongbi, Huanyao, uh, birds and flowers, such a strange uh, um, a theme, uh, motif for people to observe. Um, but this is, this is the culture in, in the literati life and in every single details. And now you are uh, revisit uh, this kind of cultural uh, practice and bring directly. And you, I really uh, 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 like your comment saying that uh, your work is nothing original. Uh, obviously it's, uh, there's original concepts behind it, but you actually bring um, things that we are not uh, noticing so much, bring them to uh, the front. And, and when you are uh, making your latest practice in terms of uh, sketching and drawing in the plants and you, you actually you, you immerse yourself and stay with the plants and it's kind of develop a sort of dialogue between yourself as a practitioner and, and the nature. So it's, 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 there's a lot of things I, I sh I'm sure that we can share and discuss. So I would like to invite um, um, any um, questions from the floor, from the audience, please. Um, Federico, do you want to talk? No, this was just actually um, an, an observation because uh, you mentioned in your, again, splendid talk about uh, the relation between um, sex and other sensory experiences like food or nature. And I remember reading something about that in, in The Ethical Slut, which is not an academic work, but still uh, tackles on these things. So it was really just an observation, but thanks again for this wonderful presentation. Federica? Yeah, um, hi. I don't know if you remember, we met in Thailand uh, for the actual project. And yeah, um, I just wanted to ask you, yeah, I have some observation and to, yeah. And also wanted to ask you a little bit about, yeah, Joshua's mentioned literati art, for example. And it's quite, how do you say, it's quite problematic, I feel like sometimes there's this, nature has been romanticized and now there are the two kind of does the urban and humankind artificial and then on the other side uh, there is what is natural that is often associated with the countryside with what is you know kind of unplanned and spontaneous um and yeah for example like in visual arts i was asking myself whether like artist like can go beyond this kind of separation uh here i'm thinking about i don't know yao lu uh, uh photographs or um or yeah other yeah of other artists for example and yeah how, if it's possible perhaps to go beyond this understanding of you know of the separation between nature and humanity that's been going on for so long that to the point that it's almost it makes me feel it's almost impossible to go beyond so I don't know I really appreciated you like yeah your how with the um, with your project with the ferns for example how like plant seems to have an agency um, at the same time when you were talking about the foresting practices I'm wondering whether is that and not like, how do you say, for, with the foresting practice in a way, like that becomes again, something that is planned by humankind that kind of go against maybe like the spontaneity of nature of that process that would naturally like um, be initiated. But I don't know if my own thinking again is like kind of going back to that, um, to that fault, to that understanding of nature as separated, uh, uh, from humankind. Uh, so yeah, I guess that was a bit of <laughs> ranting, but yeah, hopefully 
it's yeah a good starting point uh, I don't know for a discussion maybe I'll, I'll respond a little bit on the um, connection to um, Chinese art history of course you know I, probably many of you here know that I'm not trained in Chinese art history or Chinese art. Yeah, I went to the I went to the US um, when I started university. So I always feel a bit guilty that I know more about uh, Western painting history, you know, uh, Velasquez, Goya, et cetera, than Chinese painting history. I think only after I started to work with plants, I started to realize, you know, one day I was in the Shanghai Museum um, looking at a painting, I forgot which painter, uh, Chinese painting. And then I realized that the willow tree in that painting is a wild willow tree rather than a willow tree in a garden or a park because I became more sensitive to the forms of plants and you know um, the difference between uh, the same species in different situations. I'm sure pre-modern Chinese artists had much more um, you know, um, heightened sensibilities with plants. So for them, something that uh, one person is painting can be read quite easily by other contemporary. The other thing, I mean, another thing I, I you know, it's on my, notes I just haven't got time to do, but it's kind of a hypothesis. I was talking to some people at China Academy of Bar when I was teaching there. Uh, I was curious whether Chinese artists early on actually painted uh, a much more diverse set of um, plants than later time when the painting language became much more stable and the, um, the number of species also became more stable. Um, one of the early paintings I saw, it's in the exhibition in the Google, in the Palace Museum. Um, I forgot the painter again. I, I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a pre song painting. Um, the painter actually painted uh, dandelion in the Chinese painting. Uh, I can look up, in, it's in my notes somewhere. So early on, of course, Chinese artists also painted these weeds, so-called weeds. And um, I think when um, Professor Jiang was talking about huaniao, birds and flowers, it may actually be related to the urbanization of Song Dynasty and Ming Dynasty, right? So when, for example, when I go to Suzhou, now I really, if, if, you, if you go to the gardens in Suzhou, the earlier gardens in Suzhou are kind of outside the city, they have more of a rustic, um, um, more of a rustic uh, feel, and then as the 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 gardens move into the central areas, they become much more controlled, and much more condensed, and much more uh, shaped. So I start to feel um, maybe, you know, I'm hoping someone. I mean, definitely not myself, but I'm hoping some PhD students who are. Uh, other scholars will look at Chinese art history now with a different perspective, you know, really combining environmental humanities and also perhaps uh, ecological research to look at the paintings and to look at art history from a sort of more um, <clears throat> plant-centric, but also uh, sort of uh, paying more attention to the natural sciences have already discovered. I actually feel that um, this is probably, if we can actually do this, this will be closer to the actual experiences of the Chinese artists in pre-modern time, because they probably possess a lot of knowledge of plants. I have a PhD student, she's working on uh, Ming Dynasty, Feminine herbal, right? So I've also, I mean, I also did artwork on based on this. So there's a lot of things that um, we actually need to re-examine uh, in art history. You know, I, I I stopped kind of doing research projects. Now I'm just mainly focusing on my practice. I 
like Joshua said, now I actually feel there's a stronger connection between me and pre-modern Chinese art. Um, you know, I feel happy that finally I started to draw trees. Um, I started to appreciate how pre-modern Chinese painters uh, look at plants and uh, expressed their relations with plants. So I actually feel the ec ecological turn is probably helping us to see Chinese art history better. I think Stephanie has a question next. Yes, I'm here. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Zheng. Actually, my question is quite similar to the previous one, and it's also about literary artists, but the, that's gonna be, will you see yourself as a contemporary literary artist? Because I see you did a lot of, um, you know, uh, self-reflective methodology in your research plan and research, and then, you know, a little bit, for me, it's a little bit liter literally artists should do or should have some certain kind of self-reflective -re uh, kind of methodology. So what do you see about that? And the second question gonna be, um, do you see there is any, you know, relationship between being a contemporary literary artist to attend any kind of bare night? Because I know you attend so many and um, I really appreciate it, your works. Uh, it gave it gave me a lot of inspiration. So maybe you can answer my question. That's it. I think it will be sort of preposterous. Right. For, yeah, I, I think it will mm -hmm. be a bit preposterous to say that um, to claim myself a literati artist. I mean, like I said, um, um, I'm also trying to move away from this sort of creationist myth of art making art making and um, you know I, I'm thinking more about sort of collaborating with other species so unless I think if we can also I, you know if we can also redefine literati art in a way you know pro, pro, you know let's say if we can redefine literati art as a more than human art practice if we also you know I haven't thought about this until you asked me you know, if we can also think about whether literary art practice is also a collaboration between humans and non-humans, perhaps this is something interesting to think about. I, I, um, I, but I, there, there is something else. I don't, you know, I may not be a direct answer to your question, but I do think. A lot, I mean, this is not so much related to the literati situation, but I, I do. Uh, think a lot about this notion of um, uh, art and practice and art and life. I think since I moved to uh, Lantau to a village three years ago, now I'm my own living situation is surrounded by uh, plants, and you know there's also ocean right next door. So I my own life becomes more embedded with other uh, with other species with other forms of life. I think this is quite important to really uh, practice what we preach. I think it's, of course, it's very difficult. It's kind of related to the second question you raised about me participating in biennials, right? Um, you know, I, I like I said, the, the, my, my, biggest, um, my biggest negative contribution to the climate um, crisis is flying, right? Um, so I, I think the more I dive deeper into the ecological practice, the more guilty I feel. So I also um, really try very hard, try to reduce it. But of course, I still flew from Hong Kong to Berlin this year. Um, I probably will fly um, again next year, but I will try to cut down as much as possible. I'm also trying to uh, reduce the, um, kind of the material impact. I didn't talk about this. Um, I mean, there are also other projects I've been doing to try to think about how to link the art uh, production exhibition cycle into the ecological cycle. Okay, so there's projects where we compost drawing, for example, as a very small gesture to link these two issues. So I feel these are, these are of course very small gestures, but I'm, uh, of course, you know, I'm, I, I'm, 
I, I, I should be subject to criticism. And I think all of us actually should be subject to criticism to think about really the things we're doing in our professional life, whether we are really doing the right thing and whether we're doing the right thing enough. Thank you, Jumbo. Um, there is another question from Jennifer Wallens um, asking you that if you are talking to a, a group of audience of uh, Western art students, would you would you say that your art is in the category of land art? Um, I think many terms have been defined at particular moments, right? So um, land art has been associated with the group of artists, they tend to be male, white, and they tend to use a lot of machinery to create projects. So I definitely don't uh, see any intimate, I don't see any connection with their practice in these sense. Um, I, you know, I, I like uh, Hans Hacke, the German artist in New York, who uh, did social, you know, he, he He's very critical of social issues, but he also was very, um, he started working with plants very early on. I think now people start to pay attention to his practice, to, to that aspect of his practice. I think I, would, I, I see more uh, connection to his practice and also to people like uh, Louis Weinberger, who unfortunately passed away this year. So more people in the ecological realm rather than the land art period. Yeah, uh, this actually uh, led me to think about the sustainability of uh, art pieces, uh, particularly those uh, created in, 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 on, the, on the natural side. I actually got an email this morning, very early in the morning, um, an email from um, an organization in Australia asked me to nominate um, some uh, two to three public, they call it public art project, public art piece. Um, um, as the best public art project in 2020. Mm -hmm. And they know that uh, we worked on the Thailand Biennale and to see whether there is any work still uh, surviving uh, in 2020. And this actually gave me a, such a critical um, 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 moment to think, you know, whatever we created uh, in 2018, 2019, uh, two years ago, is there any work can still sustain uh, in such um, uh, a sort of uh, context? And this um, is important, um, particularly uh, for artists um, and curators to think about um, and how do we work with the nature and how do we care uh, about the ecology around us? Um, so before we close, is there any final questions? If we- Howie has one final question. Okay. Um, hello, is this, um, can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Jing. Yeah, um, thank you for the talk. And um, I have been following your work for a long time. Actually also a good friend was in the video of your Taiwan films. And um, I was wondering because previously I started following your research about social engaged art when you were uh, conducting that in the in Hong Kong, and I think you you mentioned it's related to like your answer to the land art, uh, like you mentioned like these terms are related to certain histories and group of artists, um, but yeah. um, I'm quite um, um, curious about like kind of your um, like your interest like from in in the ecology kind of have, I feel has like a, a, a root in the social engagement. And especially I really like your work that you did about the Zhuzai um, Shanghai, the Zhu, that's plants living in Shanghai. And uh, I was quite curious, like how now uh, at this time, how do you think of like this discourse around social engagement and also, um, and now you're more talking about eco and wondering like how does does this um, discourse still play an effect and in what way in your current practice and also in the future? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, um, so the, pro uh, the, the example I talk about in Kyoto kind of deals with this a little bit to think about uh, social justice with uh, ecological justice. Um, try to link my experience in social practice with uh, the current interest in plants. So by, you know, by organizing workshops and also by embedding the project in a more disenfranchised community, 
um, so the social equality issue and then the uh, ecological equality issue can be linked. And I think people, but of course, most of my projects are now, you know, it, um, um, I'm more thinking about plants so, so much more than I actually don't really have a lot of um, time spending, spend on social issues. I think people like TJ Demos at uh, UC Santa Cruz, he's uh, research and in the, in the UI situation, they really focus on uh, political ecology. They really try to foreground um, um, social justice and eco ecological justice. So perhaps their works will answer your question more um, comprehensively. I think in China, uh, you know, just to finish, um, I think in China, social, social practice has received a lot of attention over the past 10 years. Um, I think ecological practice is starting to get more uh, discussion and I feel there's a lot more to do. I mean, it's, it's my own interest, but it's also my uh, sense of the field that um, you know, we're spending more time on, on the ecological issues. Thank you very much, uh, Jinpo, for uh, the morning um, keynote speech. And uh, please do join us if you can in the afternoon. Um, and we thank uh, the uh, morning uh, panelists as well, as well as uh, David Roberts, uh, the panel chair. And we will have uh, roughly an hour's break and we will come back just before one o'clock UK time. Um, that's, um, what is it? Nine o'clock China time. Thank you very much all for your participation and we will see you later uh, in the afternoon. Bye bye. Thanks everyone. Um, I'll uh, turn, uh, you can reconvene maybe from about uh, 10 to three. I'll uh, reopen the Zoom. Thanks so much everyone. 10 to one.